What's up, everybody? My name is Jeffrey Way, and I'm so excited to show you Inertia.js in this series, which was created by Jonathan Renink. I think you're going to love it. It's so good. So as it says on the 10, Inertia allows you to build single-page applications without building an API. Instead, you reach for classic server-side routing and controllers. And that's specifically why Inertia labels itself the modern monolith. But now real quick, before we dig in and install it and have a look around, we first need to figure out what the parameters are here. So is Inertia linked to Laravel? Because it looks like it a little bit here in this example. And the answer is no. Well, is Inertia linked to Vue? And again, the answer is no. But it does offer an adapter for Laravel. And it does offer an adapter for Vue. But if you instead prefer something like React or Svelte, that works as well. Inertia is not dependent on any one technology. But that being said, if you are a Laravel user, you're going to feel right at home here. Now, you can think of Inertia not as a replacement for Vue, or it's not a big framework on top of Vue. It's really, in many ways, just a client-side routing library that connects a server-side framework like Laravel to a client-side framework like Vue. And really, that's a good way to think of it. Inertia is the glue that connects your server-side framework to your client-side framework. And the great thing is, when you do this, it allows you to continue using traditional controllers, traditional routing, traditional middleware, traditional authentication, traditional authorization. All of that stuff remains unchanged, even though you're building a single-page application. And effectively, what this translates to is, if you use inertia, then no, you don't need to build uh, an API. No, you don't need to use OAuth. No, you don't need multiple repositories for your API and your client-side application. Instead, you're building a traditional but modern monolith. It's all contained within a single application. Again, I think you're really going to love this. I do. And in fact, Laracast, under the hood, uses Inertia.js. I love it that much. Okay. So let's have a look at the demo application before we finish up. It's called Ping, and it's a traditional CRM. OK, so the first thing I want you to be aware of is how, when I click on these links, notice that we're not performing a traditional post back to the server. So if you have a look, you're not going to see any loading icon as I click here. And that's because instead, inertia is intercepting the click of these anchor tags. And instead, it submits an AJAX request to the server. So notice if I click on a link, yeah, we make an AJAX request to the given endpoint. And in response, we get a bit of JSON that contains everything our view component needs to load or refresh the current page, so to speak. We have information about the user, any potential flash messages, and then the data that this particular page requires. And that seems to be filters and organizations. Let's do another one. Let's go to the contacts page, which you see here. Well, again, we make an AJAX request. We fetch the content. And then Inertia uses this response to dynamically swap out the current page component with the new page component. And then Vue, as a result, will refresh the page automatically due to standard reactivity of view props. So notice the advantage here is you only have to load your basic assets once. You're not refetching the CSS and the scripts and the header and the footer for every single page request like you traditionally would with a standard server-side app. And what that translates to is a much faster application. OK, now the last thing I want to show you here is let's go to Inertia.js. We'll go to the GitHub page. And we're going to have a look at the Ping CRM demo application. OK, so you'll notice if we look at the routes here, these are standard Laravel routes. This should all be very familiar to you if you work with Laravel. Let's have a look at maybe, how about this one, for organizations. So that corresponds to what you see here. OK, when you visit this endpoint, we're going to load an organizations controller and then the index action. OK. Now, the index action returns not a traditional blade view like you might normally do with Laravel. Instead, we're asking Inertia to render a client-side view. But again, notice it's the same basic shape. Don't be confused here. This is just a standard eloquent query. So we are loading a view, but not a blade view, a client-side view. And then we are passing a set of data to it. 
So notice we're passing filters and organizations. Well, we saw that earlier. That's one more time. Go to the organizations page and you'll see in response, we pass through the filters and the organizations. So this is precisely what Inertia allows for. And again, that's why the creators refer to it sort of like glue. It connects the server side to the client side. And once it's done doing its job, it gets out of your way. It doesn't completely take over your application, which I really like about it. Okay, I think we're now ready to install Inertia and begin configuring it. Now, we're gonna use Laravel and Vue in this series. So why don't we start by pulling in a fresh Laravel app. I'll just call it Demo. All right, let's CD in there. And if we now visit this in the browser, of course, we see the standard Laravel splash page. Okay, now let's install Inertia. If I switch back to the website, again, we need to grab two adapters. Inertia has an adapter for your server-side framework, like Laravel or Rails, and then it has another adapter for your client-side framework, like Vue 2 or Vue 3 or React or Svelte. We're gonna start with the server-side adapter. So we'll install the dependencies. Okay. Next, we need to set up our root template. Think of this as your layout file for an Inertia app. And it should look pretty familiar other than this Inertia directive. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm gonna copy this and let's open this in my editor. And let's go to resources, views, and let's do this. I'm gonna rename the welcome page to app.blade.php. And if I select everything, we can replace it with what we got from the documentation. Okay, and let's add the link. Okay, so a standard layout file. The only unique thing is this inertia directive. And really, this is just a convenience. Ultimately, it expands to something like this, a div with an ID of app, where we pass to it the initial page data. So yeah, that would be something like, and you've probably done this in your own projects at some point or another, where you JSON encode a piece of server-side data, and then you pass it as a view prop. And yeah, really, that's it. So this is how we pass the initial page data to Inertia. Anyways, you can stick with the Inertia directive. Same thing. Now, if I switch back to the documentation, the next thing we need to do is set up the initial middleware. And we'll talk about this more a little bit later, but it effectively tells Laravel how to provide the proper response to inertia. So let's go ahead and run that. And if I switch to my editor, that's going to create a new app, HTTP, middleware, handle inertia requests file. Okay, but of course, we have to first register it in our kernel class. And let's scroll down to your standard web middleware group and we'll add it here. Okay, and that's basically it for the server side setup. So the next step is to set up the client side adapter. And again, Inertia provides first party support for React, Vue, uh, and Vue 3, as well as Svelte. Okay, so I'm gonna use Vue 3 here. We're gonna pull in the Inertia package and then specifically the Vue 3 adapter. So let's run that now. And while that's doing its thing, the next step is to initialize your app. Now I'm gonna assume you have a basic familiarity with Vue. Uh, even if you're not yet familiar with Vue 3, we can work through that. But mostly you're creating a Vue app the way you normally would. You then use the Inertia plugin and you mount it to your root element. So that sets up Vue. Then we need to set up our Inertia app and then instruct it how to find your current page component. And we'll talk about all of this, so you don't need to feel overwhelmed if you don't quite understand what's going on here. For now, just copy and paste and then move on. So I'm gonna grab this, and of course, if I'm using Vue, I need to go ahead and pull that in through NPM. And then for Vue 3, if we also wanna support single file components, which we do, then we also need to pull in one additional package, and this is just standard Vue stuff. It's not related to inertia at all. So let's do installation through NPM. And yeah, we also wanna pull in this package here. Okay, so now in my project, we'll go to resources, JS, app. You'll see that requires a bootstrap file, but we're not gonna use any of this right now. So I will delete that and then paste in the code we got from Inertia's website. Now, real quick, before we compile everything down, Notice when we create our Inertia app, we tell it how to track down the current page component. And at the moment, and by 
common convention, we're asking it to look in a pages directory. So why don't we go ahead and create that directory now? And again, this is what I do for Laracast as well. It's very common. Now, the final step is to compile this down. And we're gonna use Laravel Mix as this is a Laravel site. We're compiling the JavaScript here. We're going to turn on view support and it will try to figure out which version you're using or you can hard code the version. In this case, view three. And then lastly, let's turn on versioning support. And that's basically going to add a hash to your compiled files to deal with cache busting. And actually on that note, in app.play.php, you can see this example is already configured to use Laravel Mix. So it's gonna look for this file and that will expand to a cache busted path to where that asset is located. Okay, so a little bit of setup, but you only have to do it once for a project. So let's install any remaining dependencies we have, and then we'll compile this down. All right, and now I can run mix or npx mix, and that will pull in any required dependencies we have. Let's do it one more time, and that should compile everything down according to our configuration, and it did. So yeah, notice it compiled these two files down. Those will be referenced in your mix manifest, and notice each one points to a path to the file, including a unique query string. So then when we use the mix helper function, that will expand to the location of those files. Okay, and that's the entire setup process. We're now done. So of course, if we were to come back and give this a refresh, because we deleted that welcome page, we see an error here, but that's okay. We entirely expected that. So in the next episode, we're gonna return to our routes file and figure out how to return and render a client side view and page component. Stay tuned. So now that we've installed and configured Inertia, we can now create our first page. So we'll start by going to my Laravel routes file. And here you can see it's returning that old blade view that we deleted. Now, if we were to reproduce this, I could swap out the view helper function with an inertia helper function. And then by convention, we often capitalize these names. But it's effectively the same thing as when you return a blade view. The only difference is we're now basically returning a client side view. Now again, by default, these pages will be stored in the pages directory. So I'm gonna create that now. Welcome. And just as a little refresher, don't forget in your main entry point, here's where we instructed Inertia where to find our pages. Look in the pages directory for that file. So notice if I switch back, yeah, you didn't have to say pages slash welcome. That base directory is assumed. Okay, so within here, Let's start off really simple. Hello world. All right, so let's compile this down and then view it in the browser. And it works. This is a good feeling. And in fact, if I take a look at the source, you'll notice it was inserted into our layout file as we'd expect. But let's have a deeper look. I'd recommend installing a tool called View DevTools. You can see I've already done it, but if you wanna do it, all you need to do is search for Vue.js DevTools, and there should be extensions for Chrome and Firefox. So if you use Chrome, I'm actually in Firefox in this case, then you would add it here. Okay, so then come back to your browser. Sometimes you need to exit out and bring it back, but then when you open up the inspector, you should have a new tab. And this is pretty sharp. I think you're gonna like this. And this is your top level component. This is where information about the initial page will be passed through. So notice we wanna load the welcome view and here's the props that will be shared with it. And sure enough, if we scroll down, here is your welcome view. So it's very much like a blade view, but on the client, which means you get the full benefit of JavaScript and view interactivity and reactivity. You get it for free, but this all still feels very familiar. All right, let's now pass some data. I will return to my routes file. Now, actually a quick note here. Yes, we can use the inertia helper function, and that's fine if you prefer, or you can import inertia, and then you can instead say inertia render. And this is going to achieve the exact same thing. So in the same way that you could say, if you're rendering a blade view, you could say view make or view, the same is true. You could say inertia render or inertia. Now the docs usually demonstrate this approach, so I'm gonna stick with that just to be consistent. Now notice the, the API here, so to speak, is very familiar, and on purpose it's familiar with how you would load a blade view. 
you provide the name of the view or the page in this case. And then as the second argument, you would pass an array of data that will be extracted and passed as props to your page component. So as an example, if I were to pass a typical name here, you know, the thing we all do when we're learning something new, I would then go to my welcome page component and I will now accept it as a prop. So our props are, we expect a name that should be a string and I'll reformat. And that's all we have to do here. This is inertia doing its thing. So why don't we say hello, comma, name. Now don't forget, if I come back and refresh, it'll still say hello world because we haven't recompiled our code. So instead of running mix, usually run mix watch, and this will keep an eye on your files for changes and then recompile. So now if I come back and give it a refresh, sure enough, it works. All right, so here's the rule. Whenever you want to pass data from a server-side controller to your view page, you need to declare it as an accepted prop, and then you pass that through when you return and render your inertia response. Okay, so now why don't we tweak this? Instead of welcome, maybe we'll have a home page. So I will change that name and then update the corresponding view page. So that should have recompiled. So if I give it a refresh, we still see the same thing. Next, why don't we pass through an array of data? And again, as an example, we'll just pass through some of the technologies that we'll be using in this series. So frameworks, and we're gonna be using, of course, Laravel, and Vue, and Inertia. All right, so back to our page component, and we're now going to accept a list of frameworks. All right, let's give it a shot. Come back to Firefox, give it a refresh. And now if I open up Vue DevTools in my home component, sure enough, I've received that array of data. I mean, how cool is that? It's so seamless. And again, if I go back to the top level inertia component, you can find all of the props that are passed down here. And by the way, if you're curious about errors, how is that being passed through? We'll talk about that a little more a bit later. So let's finish up by iterating over that array. In this series, we will use the following frameworks. And then we'll do some basic view iteration. This has nothing to do with inertia. V4 framework in or of frameworks, then set V text to framework. All right, and that should do it. So it compiles down behind the scenes, we give it a refresh, and we've now successfully rendered a client side page and passed data to it from the server side. That's pretty neat. In the next episode, we'll keep going. All right, next up, I'd like to create a few different pages and then learn how to seamlessly link between them. Let's do this. Back in my editor, I'll go to my routes file and this data here, this was only an example. So let's get rid of all of it. And now let's create two new pages. So maybe if we visit slash users, that will show a page to browse your users. And then if you visit slash settings, that will load a settings page. All right, now let's create those page components. So let's do this. That was only an example. Bring it back. Okay, let's duplicate this to save some time. So we'll have users and then another one for settings. Great, so settings will say settings and users will say users. Okay, so I have Mixwatch running behind the scenes. Why don't we see if this still works? Give it a refresh, there's home. Next we'll have users and next we'll have settings. It works. Okay, now of course, we don't wanna manually edit the URL. We want an anchor tag that links between them. Now we're gonna talk about layout files a little bit later. So for now, we'll have to use a little bit of duplication, but that's okay. So in our home page, let's do this. We'll say nav, and then we'll have an unordered list. We'll have three of them. I'm just doing a little shorthand here where each one contains an anchor tag that links somewhere. Okay, so this would be home, this would be users, and this would be settings. Okay, next let's update the URIs users and settings. Okay, let's see if that works. So if I come back to my home page, give it a refresh, yes, I see those links. And if I click on one, it sort of works. But what's going on here? I go to settings, and what I wanna point your attention to is we're actually performing a full page refresh. So one more time, I want you to focus on this page load here. Ah, did you see it? Why don't we make it a little more clear? 
in my routes file, why don't we sleep for a little bit? Sleep for two seconds. Okay, so come back. Now if I click on the users page, one, two, we're performing a full page refresh, which defeats the entire purpose. That's not a single page application. That's a traditional application that loads a view component. Now, the solution is to not use a standard anchor tag where we don't have much control, but to instead replace it with a slight wrapper that Inertia provides, and it's called the link component. The link component is ultimately an anchor tag, but when you click on it, Inertia will intercept that and instead perform an AJAX request to the server. The server, due to that middleware we had installed, remember in episode one, handle Inertia requests, that will understand that it needs to return a JSON response that contains all the information about the new page. Okay, so let's do that now. So I will import this link component from Inertia View 3. And again, if you're using View 2 or React, then you would pull it in through that package. Next, standard view work here. We're registering it as a component. And now we can use it in our template. So right here, replace them with link. Okay, so now if we give it another shot, now don't forget when I click on this user's link, the server side is still delayed. It's sleeping for two seconds. And we're going to talk about how to deal with that uh, in the next episode. But for now, the important thing is that I'm not performing a full page refresh. Maybe this will make it more clear. Let's open up the dev tools and I'm going to listen for XHR requests. Okay, users, one, two, and there's our response right here. And we get a JSON response that contains the new component we want to use. So then Inertia will read this JSON response and it will see, oh, you're trying to load the user's component. Let me go ahead and swap that out. And then view will automatically re-render it. So in effect, if I go back to the inspector, Everything up here, this will remain. It's not going to get reloaded because again, we're not performing a full page refresh. So one more time, when I click on say settings, the only thing that's being swapped out here is this page component here. And this is exactly how we can allow for a very responsive feeling website. Okay, but of course, right now, one of our issues is the navigation is only on the home page. So like I said, we're eventually going to extract a layout file. But until we do that, let's take baby steps. Why don't we move this nav into a new component called nav? So I'm going to add a directory called shared. Again, this is a standard uh, inertia convention. Any shared components that your whole website will reach for can go here. OK, let's add one called nav. And I'm going to paste that in. But now don't forget, this component doesn't know what link is. We would still have to import it again. So if you want, there are ways to automatically share link across all of your page components. So if you don't want to re-import it every single time, that is an option if you want it. But for now, let's just pull it in like we did before. Inertia view three, we're at least building up the muscle memory and then register it as a component. Great. So now we have a dedicated component for our navigation. We only need to swap this out now. So we're no longer currently using the link component, though we might pull it in. Instead, I'm going to pull in nav. And notice we're in the pages directory. So we go up into the shared folder into nav, and then we will update that. Great. So now we'll say nav and reformat. OK, now we're going to update these as well. So I'm just going to do some copy and paste here. And again, like I said, once we learn how to extract a layout file, you would only have to insert that nav a single time. But for now, we're going to do a little duplication, and that's OK. All right, so cross your fingers with any luck. We should have the most basic form of a three-page website that is, in fact, a single-page application. So we'll go to Settings. And again, notice no full page refresh. It's very very fast. Now, of course, users, the server side is delaying that by two seconds. So notice it does work, but when I click on it, there's no feedback. So one, two, what's going on here? I have no idea. And then the page updates. So the next step is I'd like to give the user a little feedback that, hey, we're doing some potentially long running process in the background. So just sit tight. 
To allow for that, we're going to pull in a progress bar, and we'll do that in the next episode. Now, if you're working along, and I hope you are, return to the inertia documentation and scroll down to the bottom, and we're going to take a look at progress indicators. You'll see right here, inertia provides an optional progress library, which shows a loading bar whenever you make an inertia visit. That is what we want. Okay, so to use it, we need to install it through NPM. So let me exit out of Mix, pull that in, and then what next? Initialize it in your app. So we import it, and then we call inertiaprogress.init. And also take note while we're here, you can override certain options if you want, like the color of the loading bar or whether a spinner will display. Okay, so let's go to PHP Storm into our app.js. We're gonna pull in inertia progress. And then finally down here at the bottom, inertia progress.init. And I think that should do it. So let's boot up our Webpack Watcher again and back to Firefox. Refresh the page and if I click on users, we have a two second delay, but notice you saw that little indicator at the top. One more time, go to users, one, two, and now the user has just a little more feedback. Now, like I said, if you want, you can override some of the options, like maybe you want the color to match your site branding. Let's just say it's red uh, for brevity. Refresh, go to users, and now you'll see a red loading bar. Okay, why don't we also add a spinner? So show spinner is true. By default, it's false. And we should see it right up here in the top right. Refresh the home page, go to users, and have a look right there. So now you have a loading bar and then also a spinner in the top right. And in fact, if you go to Laracast for any long running pages that are a little more complicated, you will see that loading indicator there. Useful. Now let's return to inertia links for one more episode and figure out how we can create non get requests. For example, if you want to make a post request or a patch request, how do we do that with inertia? And there's actually a couple ways. Now let's do this. I will return to my routes file and let's create a dummy route for logging out. So if you visit slash logout, we should log out to the user. But of course, as you may know, we should really perform that as part of a post request. It adds just a little bit more security. If it were a get request, then over on John Doe's website, he could create a link that when clicked would log you out of my website. So when we switch to post, we protect against that a bit and we do add CSRF protection as part of the request. Okay, now we don't have any authentication system here. I haven't pulled in Laravel Breeze or anything like that. So I'm just gonna die and say, logging the user out. All right, we now have our endpoint. The next step will be to return to our nav bar and let's add another link here to log out. Now, of course, in future episodes, I will show you how to conditionally display links like this based on for example, if the user is signed in or not. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Right now, we're still playing around with inertia links. Okay, so yeah, if I did this, well, of course, it's gonna make a get request to that endpoint. Let's give it a shot. So back to Firefox, I give it a refresh, and here's our logout link. And yeah, of course, if we run it, well, two things. Of course, it fails because we haven't registered a route to respond to a get request to log out. But second, notice when we have errors in inertia, they display in this nice modal. And we're gonna set this up so that it only displays in your local environment, but nonetheless, it's incredibly useful. I like it a lot, and I think it actually was inspired by Laravel Livewire, which is pretty cool when the two can inspire each other. So anyways, how do we turn this into a post request? Well, as you know, traditionally, you would have to wrap the whole thing in a form that submits a post request but inertia has a little bit of sugar to clean this up. Let's add the method attribute and set it to post. Okay, that's all we need to do. So if I come back and give it a refresh, I'm gonna bring up the network tab to XHR. And this time when I click log out, notice we do submit a post request and we do get the response from that endpoint. All right, but let's see what's going on here. If I view the source here, yeah, it's still just rendering an anchor tag. But behind the scenes, Inertia will have an event handler to listen for that click, and then it will submit a post request to the endpoint. And behind the scenes, Inertia uses the Axios library to perform the requests. Which means, by the way, if you're using Laravel, passing through the CSRF token is automatic, because Laravel will automatically include it as part of the response, and then Axios will automatically check to see 
if a cookie exists. Okay, but now there's one little snag here. Because it's an anchor tag, that means on a Mac, I can command click on it. And notice when I do that, of course, I can't submit a post request as part of opening a new tab. So we once again get this familiar error. So really, in this case, I don't want to render an anchor tag. I really just want something like a button. Okay, no problem. In those cases, let's declare that we want to render this link as a button. And now, notice if I refresh the page, we have the default styling here, but we are rendering it as a button. And we get the same thing when I click on it. Okay, and that's usually what you will want in this case. Now, in terms of styling, you may run into this where you want the button to look the same as the links. So generally, you will want to reset the styling for a button or pull in a CSS library that has a normalizer that, that automatically resets this. For example, if I were using something like Tailwind, which is really popular, let's do it right up here. I have a little snippet to pull that in, version two of Tailwind, but notice that automatically will reset it. So if I give this a refresh, I lose a little of my automatic styling here, and that's okay. But it does render exactly the same as the links. So actually, real quick, if we want to fix that, let's go to Home and force some styling here. Maybe text 4XL and font bold. Next, the navigation will have some margin on top. And then let's be explicit that we want list disk. Finally, I think that's about it. Why don't we add, real quick, a section here. And we'll add a class of, and for all sections, maybe we'll have PX, uh, I don't know, eight or something like that. Or actually, in this case, let's just do padding eight all around. Anyways, if we close that out and return to Firefox, here's what we get. Next, we might want to add some initial styling for all of our nav links. Or if you want to remove some duplication, you could even extract each of these into a nav link component, which I often do. Uh, so for example, maybe we want the most basic form of a link, almost the default styling. So text blue, and then when you hover over it, underline it, uh, something like that. But yeah, if you want to remove the duplication, extract it into its own nav link component. Anyhow, come back, and there we go. Whether we have an anchor tag or a button, it all looks and renders the same. And this time, if I command click to try to open it in a new tab, it's not going to work because it's not an anchor tag. It's a button. Now, in closing, of course, you can submit any request type you want. So if you want to submit a patch request or a delete request, you can do so. And you can even pass through the data as an attribute, which is kind of cool. So for example, if I wanted to say uh, foo is bar. Now, if we come back and refresh, have a look here. When I make the post request, notice that it will pass through that data as part of the request. So then, of course, on the server side, just fetch it the way you always would. So for example, if you want to die and dump and grab foo, this would do the trick. One more time, and you get the value for foo. Now, in closing, I think you'll find, if I switch back to the nav component, this is incredibly useful for simple interactions like this, where typically you'd have to create a form, listen for it to be submitted, and then make the Ajax request. You can now do it as part of the link component. But for larger things, you might want to instead reach for Inertia's form helper. But for now, this should get you going. Now, while we're on the subject of links, another useful feature is the ability to preserve your scroll position. Let me show you what I mean. Why don't we visit our users component? And as an example down here in a div, let's simply render the current time. So I will say the current time is, and then we'll pass that through from the server side. Mostly to show that we are fetching new data from the server and Vue is reacting to the change in props. All right, so let's declare our prop time and that will be of type string. Now the next step is to return to our routes file and I can go ahead and get rid of sleep. But now I'm gonna pass through the current time. And for that, I can just use carbon. So I can do something like now to time string, and that should be fine. Okay, so now this route will load the user's component and pass through the current time. Our view component will accept that time and then render it in this paragraph tag. So if we come back to Firefox, refresh, and visit the users page, I can see the current time. And of course, every time I refresh, you'll see that bump up. 
Okay, but now let's push it far down the page. Let's say margin top is something like 400 pixels, just to force a scroll bar. Okay, so now if I come back and refresh, I have to scroll to see this at the bottom. All right, next, let's add a link here that will make a request to the current page to fetch the latest data, and in this case, the latest time. Now what you'll find when we do that, and first I'll have to import it, or again, remember you can share this globally if it's kind of annoying to you to always import a link component. Anyways, we can register it here, and then I'll add a link to the current page, and we'll say refresh. And that should be good. We'll give it a blue color, and I think we're ready to try this out. All right, so back to Firefox. Give it a refresh, and here's our link. So here's what I want you to notice. When I click on any typical link, it's going to behave the way you'd expect. It reloads the page, and it scrolls back up to the top. And this is often what you want, but not always. In plenty of situations, you will want to maintain the current scroll position. Here's a simple example. Maybe you're reading a blog post that has a like button. And when you click on it, well, of course, it's going to mark that you liked the post. And then it returns a redirect back to the current blog post. And then as part of that, maybe it will display and reflect that you did like that particular post. Anyways, when it performs that redirect, you probably don't want it to send you back to the top of the page. No, instead, you want that scroll position to remain unchanged. So we can do that in inertia by adding the preserve scroll attribute. And that's all there is to it. So if I come back to Firefox, give it a refresh, and if I click on this link again, I want you to notice that the time will update, but the scroll bar will remain unchanged. There we go, 45, 46, 47, and do note, every single time I hit this link here, we are making an Ajax request. There's another, there's another, there's another. So I promise you, you're gonna find so many different use cases for this. Another typical example, before I let you go, might be something like a table layout, maybe for a CMS. And when you click on any toggle to adjust the order or filter it, Again, you don't want to effectively reset the user back to the top of the page every time they change one of those filters. Instead, you want to maintain their current scroll position. And you do that by adding the preserve scroll attribute. Next up is active links. So notice if I click around to the navigation here, at the moment, on the link itself, there's no visual indication that it's currently active. And of course, this is something we should offer. So let's see what we can do here. I'm gonna visit my navigation component, and on the home page itself, why don't we set a conditional class? For example, let's make the link bold and underlined if some condition happens to be true. For now, I'm gonna force it, and that'll reformat. All right, so not quite right, but if I switch back, ideally, this is how we want it to look. If I'm on the home page, it's bold and underlined. But yeah, at the moment, as soon as I click away, it doesn't update. So in Inertia, we have access to this page property. And actually, if you wanna take a look at it, let's open up View DevTools, and you can find it here, the initial page. Now, I wanna point your attention to two properties here. First up is the current URL, and second is the current page component that we're on. Okay, we're gonna leverage both of those to set these active links. So what if I said, check to see if the page URL is the home page? Only on that condition should we make it bold and underlined. So now if I go to the home page, it works. But if I click away to users or settings, it turns off. This is what we want. Okay, so yeah, of course, I could select all of this and duplicate it here and update the link to users. And then one more to, what is it, settings, yeah. Give it a reformat and this would do the trick. So now if I come back and refresh, we do have more visual feedback. It works. But now one thing to be a little careful, what if for whatever reason, when you click on the user's link, it adds some kind of query string, maybe a filter or something like that. Well, now our active links will break because we're checking to see if the URL is precisely users, but now it's users and then a query string. 
So notice if we come back, give it a refresh, and now click on Users, yeah, we don't get that visual styling. And again, that's because of the query string. Okay, so remember, we're dealing with basic JavaScript here. So if you want, we could just say, all right, well, I don't want to do a perfect match of users, but how about if it starts with slash users, that's enough. All right, basic JavaScript here, users. Okay, come back. And now if I give it a refresh, we fixed the issue. Now it'll remain active no matter how much we have here. Refresh, and that still works. Of course it does. Okay, but now here's another thing to consider. If I bring back View Dev Tools, we did see it marks the current components or the current page component we're using. So if you think about it, there's nothing preventing us from using that instead. Think about it. If I switch back, now, instead of basic string matching, I could say, check to see if the component is users. And I bet that'll do the trick now. So if I come back and try it again, we click on users with a full query string, but it is still bold. Because now we're matching not against the current URI, we're matching against the currently active page component. And that page component, just to make sure we're clear, is the users page component. Okay, so yeah, if we wanted to take that approach, we would say something like, if the page component is home, and then down here, check to see if the page component is settings. And that would work as well. Come back, refresh, and we have our active links. Okay, so that mostly does it, but real quick before we wrap up, what we have here I think is perfectly fine. I don't personally have an issue with it. But if you'd like to remove a little of this duplication, again, there's nothing preventing you from extracting any number of components to wrap things up. So for example, maybe you want to set up a nav link component. That is a wrapper around the link, which is a wrapper around the anchor tag. You can wrap this up as many times if you want, if it makes you feel better. And then you could even add custom attributes like, um, I don't know, active. And that will determine whether or not we make it bold. So the logic would be here. So if we do things right, we want this to be identical to this. All right, so let's see if we can make it work. I'm gonna add a new view component here called nav link, and I'll paste in what we have there. Next, we'll declare our props, and we know one is active, that'll be a Boolean. And then of course, I also have to import my link component. So I'll do that here and then register it. Finally, I can replace this hard-coded conditional with whatever active evaluates to. Okay, last thing, the href is gonna be passed through automatically because the component will inherit any attributes you send through that are not registered as props. So I can end up with something like this, and then I'll turn this into a slot. All right, I think that'll do the trick. So now, if we come back up, the only remaining thing I need to do is set the text here, so home. All right, so let's get rid of that and give it a reformat, and then I'll do the exact same thing to these as well. This will return to slash users, and we'll set that, all right? And then finally, one more for the settings page. This is now settings, check for settings, update the text, and whoops, update that as well. And yeah, here's what we get. So notice we have cleaned it up a little bit and we have removed some of that class duplication. The only remaining step is to import the navlink component. Import navlink and then update the component reference. All right, and then finally this old link. We don't need any more. All right, let's give it a shot. Refresh and we get the same thing as we had before. So that's just a slight refactor if and only if you think it's worth it. Okay, we can finally move on to layout files. So if I switch back, I want you to notice how all of our pages at the moment are manually importing the nav and then adding it here. So it's in home, it's in settings, and it's also in users as well. 
So if I end up with 20 different pages, that's 20 different times I have to pull in the navigation and render it where it needs to go. Clearly, you already know this, that's not quite right. So instead, let's prepare a layout file and I'll add it to my shared directory. So the very first thing I'll do here is pull in our nav. And then of course I need to import it. All right, and then register it as a component. All right, so now our nav will exclusively live within this layout file. Okay, so now, for example, if I go back to home, let's swap this out with our layout and then we'll wrap it up here. All right, and then put everything in except the navigation, of course. Okay, but this still isn't quite right. If I switch back to Firefox and give this a refresh, I've lost the main contents of the home page, And that would make sense. We've added a layout here and we've added some content there, but at no point do we make use of that. So again, right now, I'm just gonna put it below the nav. All right, that recompiles. And if I give it a refresh, we get what we had before. But again, now the nav exclusively lives within this layout. So next, while we're here, maybe we'll have a header and we'll have our main app name, my app. And maybe we want this to render like a typical navigation bar that you've seen a million times. So right up here, it's, it's a different background color. The heading is on the left or the title, and then the navigation is in line on the right. Okay, well first I'm gonna make this maybe font bold and text large. Next, the header itself will have a display of flex. And then while we're here in the nav section, the unordered list should also be a display of flex. And then the nav, why don't we push that away from the header? So maybe margin left, and I'm just throwing out numbers here, maybe six. All right, we give it a refresh. We're getting there, but this is too close. Uh, we don't yet have a background color. And then the navigation bullets are on top of each other. So for the bullets, we either remove them completely or there's a couple of things we could do. First, we could use this Tailwind class called space X and then we give it a figure like four. I really like this one. It will automatically add margin where necessary to the direct children of the element that you apply it to. So notice you have margin, if we scroll down here, you have margin on that second list item and the last list item, but not on the first, which would be correct. Okay, but again, the bullets are still not quite right. So there's also, what is it, list style position. And we could set that to inside. So again, that's just expanding to this CSS property, list style position inside. And again, that's a little bit closer to what we want. So let's come on back and paste that in. Okay, next, we did say that we want a background color. So for example, if we end up very, very basic with a very light background of gray, mm, it's close, but now we have this huge white border. And that's because you'll remember on our main blade layout file, we added a section with a bunch of padding. So it sounds like that's probably not quite what we want anymore. So if I remove that, yes, everything extends to the edges of the window, but of course we will manually need to reapply it. So what I usually do is add sections for this. So my section represents the thing that adds the padding that pushes it away from the edge of the window. So if I did something like that, and again, I'm just throwing out a number here, padding six. Well, then I could add our background color there. And then for our slot, maybe that also is a section. And right now I'm just duplicating that padding, which is fine. Uh, if you want, you could also extract something like an app section component, and that would contain your default padding. Maybe it even has a container within it, but I'm, I'm gonna hold off on that for now. Okay. So now I have a section for my header and a section for my main content. The last step I think is, let's just get rid of that section entirely and uh, let's check in. Come back to Firefox, give it a refresh and we're a little bit closer there. I think we could probably reduce this font size a bit, but other than that, we're not trying to build anything specific here. We just want it to somewhat resemble a site you might build. So here maybe our header is 2XL. And uh, that's not horrid. Maybe three and get rid of the bold. But now one quick thing, notice if I zoom out all the way to simulate a widescreen device, everything's up against the left edge. And you may want your main content to be centered. 
So you may want to wrap your slot in a div, give that a reformat, and maybe we'll set a maximum width of, I don't know, 2XL. That's 42 rims. If you want to calculate that in pixels, multiply that by your root font size, which is 16. And that gives us 672, which is still fairly narrow, but it's probably fine for what we're building. Why don't we give it one more? 48 rims. 48 times 16 is 768. That's fine. And then I'll set the margin to auto to center it on the page. And that's what we get. Or if I reset it, we get something like this. So yeah, if, you, if it helps, right here, background of gray, and you kind of get the idea. Your main website would go there. Okay, so with that in mind, why don't we return to our header and let's say justify between. I've changed my mind here. Let's push the navigation to the right edge. So I will remove that margin left. And there you go. All right, so excuse that tiny bit of design, uh, but I do want to get back to inertia here. So I want you to notice now our layout file typically contains anything that should be repeated from page to page. So your header, the wrapper around your main content, if you have a site footer, you would probably do it down here as well. And then all of your pages would effectively extend from it, like you can see in our home component. All right, so now I'm going to update settings as well. And because it's the same process, I'm going to speed this up. Like so. So now users extends from layout, settings does as well, and home does a third time. So come back to Firefox, give it a good refresh. And now as I click between the pages, I'll need to adjust the font size there. But nonetheless, everything is working like it did before. But now we are using layout files. So now that we're using layout files, how do we deal with shared data that should be passed for every single page request? For example, if you're signed in, maybe it should say, welcome back, John Doe, right up here. All right, well, yeah, if you think about it, inside the sidebar, if I go to my home page, yeah, you could pass it here. So for example, I could say username, and of course, in real life, you would check if they're authenticated, but assuming they are, all right, well then, if you think about it, I'd have to go to my home view. We would have to accept it as a prop, so username is a string, and then I'd need to pass that to our layout component. So already this is feeling a little cumbersome. But yeah, this would be the manual way. And then down here, same thing. We're accepting that prop again. Finally, I can use it. So maybe something like, welcome back, username. And then finally, because we have a display of flex on this header, let's wrap this within a div and reformat. All right, let's have a look. And sure enough, we do see welcome back, John Doe. Now actually, real quick, why don't we do display a flex, and then I will align the items to the center, and then finally on the paragraph tag, we'll make it text, I don't know, small. And then maybe a little margin left to push it away from the logo, quote unquote. All right, that should be enough. So if we switch back, you get the general idea. But yeah, you're not wrong. This is pretty cumbersome. We have to pass the data to your page component, the page component needs to accept it. And then it also needs to pass that data to your layout component. The layout component needs to accept it and only then can it render it. But here's the worst part. As soon as I switch over to the users page, we've broken it again because then the users page would also need to pass through the username. And very quickly, you can see how this falls apart. Okay, so this is all to illustrate that it can be useful to provide shared data that's available to all components. And information about the authenticated user is a perfect example of this. So let's figure out how to do it. I'll start by getting rid of that data prop there. And then in home, I'll get rid of that, like so. And then I'm basically just resetting what we already did. Okay, so now we're not passing any information about the current user. Instead, we're gonna do that as part of a middleware. Now you remember when we installed Inertia, we added, or Inertia added, a handle Inertia requests middleware. I think it's time to have a look at this. So if I scroll down, this is the interesting part. 
define the props that are shared by default. And you'll see we have an empty array, which makes sense for a new project, but it does merge in any data from the parent method. So if I go on up, we can see, ah, so initially any applicable validation errors will be shared by default, which is why if I come back and take a look at view dev tools, in the initial page, you'll notice that you always have information about the errors. Now you know why. It's being passed automatically by inertia. Okay, but we can add our own set of data. So if I set foo is bar and come back and give this a refresh, now I can access it here, foo is bar. And notice if I go to, let's say settings, give it a refresh, I'm still going to have access to foo. Okay, so incredibly convenient, but also at the same time, you need to be very thoughtful about this. You don't wanna pass more data than you actually require, because again, this is being shared for every request. Okay, so we could do that username thing, but it's also quite common to namespace it. And that's because you could imagine for, for another page on your site, at some point, a username prop is being passed. And in that case, there will be a conflict, of course. So if we namespace it, and again, this is a common inertia convention, you might end up with something like this. The auth user, and then maybe username. And again, I'll hard code that to John Doe. Okay, this is looking good. So now think about it. Regardless of which page I'm on, I now have access to an auth prop that contains information about the current user. And of course, if you're building a Laravel app, you could do something like this, but, but you need to be super careful about this. Remember, anything you pass here is being sent to the client side. So if you have columns on your users table that you don't want the end user to see, uh, maybe information, uh, I don't know, maybe a token or information about their subscription status or notes or things like that. Well, with what you have here, it's getting sent to the client side, which means they can see it if they want to inspect DevTools. So again, as a rule, only pass the data that you absolutely need. You can do this by being explicit, like we've done here, or you can leverage Laravel's API resources, and we'll have a look at that as well. Anyways, hard coding it for now, we'll do the trick. So if I switch to my layout file now, again, I don't have to declare a prop or anything like that. I can access it directly off of the page component. Again, notice initial page and we'll use page, which is a shared property that Inertia provides, and it gives us access to that initial page. Go into the props, go into auth, go into user, and grab the username. And that should do it. So come back, give it a refresh, and sure enough, we see John Doe. And yeah, if that's confusing, remember, we're going right down the list there. Give me the page, then go into props, then go into auth, then go into user, and then go into username. Or don't forget, if you're gonna be accessing this in multiple places, you could also have a computed prop. So for example, username would return and same thing, page.props.auth.user.username. And just remember right here, it's squawking because we wanna access it off of the current instance if we're using it here. Okay, so now you could bring this back to username and you're going to get the same thing. So that's an option as well. Give it a refresh and now we get welcome back John Doe, regardless of which page we're on. So what we have here is a very easy way to work with shared data. Now, before we move on to persistent layouts in the next episode, first I'd like to quickly touch on global component registration. For example, if you find it a little annoying or at least cumbersome that every time you want to render what is effectively an anchor tag, you first have to import it and then add it as a component. I don't think it's a huge deal, but I do agree it can be a little cumbersome and it does take you out of the flow. Now, the reason why it's not available automatically, well, it's, it's probably a few reasons. One, there are potential benefits to tree shaking when compiling down your code. Two, it can often help with your editor's static analysis of the current component. And then three, it's generally just a good practice when you're building view plugins to, without the user's knowledge, register a set of components globally through the entire app. So for that reason, you have to manually do it, or if it makes sense, you can register it globally yourself. And here's how. In your app.js file, where we create our app and we use the Inertia plugin, 
As part of that, let's also register a component called link, and I'll pull that in here, and I can do that automatically. So import your link from Inertia View 3, and then we will register it as a global component. And if you want to do more, just call component again. So maybe you want to do a head component or something like that. Here is where you can take care of that. Okay, so now with this small change, you no longer have to manually import it. You could get rid of this, like so, and everything is still going to work. If I come back to Firefox and give this a refresh, notice I still have my link here, and it does update the time when I click on it. Yeah, so that's an option. Generally, I would say be thoughtful about what you register globally. You can often run into some traps here. Now, for a link component, you use it so often. Personally, I think it's worth it. But again, make up your own mind on this. Now, one more thing to consider. Let's bring this back. And then on users, I'll bring it back to what we had before. Another option, if you're using Vue 3 and Vue's composition API, is this new script setup style. This makes the process of using the Composition API just a little more friendly. Think of it as sugar for manually exporting an object that declares a setup method. So for example, I could get rid of all of this, and simply by importing the components here, I then have access to them automatically. Now you'll see here my editor is squawking a little bit. This should work. So my guess is PHPStorm doesn't quite yet understand how to parse Vue's script setup. I bet they're working on that right now. But nonetheless, if I were to switch back to Firefox and refresh, I still see my link. But do notice I've lost the time, and that's because if I bring it back, we did accept time as a prop. So again, it's a slight change to how you build your components. But if you're using script setup, you could use this macro called define props, and this would be the same thing. And again, because this is all relatively new at the time of this recording, my editor is having a little bit of trouble, but if I give it a refresh, this is all to assure you everything still works. So I just have to wait for my particular editor to catch up. But yeah, I bring this up to illustrate that if you use script setup, it then becomes that much easier to locally register your components. So if I want to use a layout or a link, it's as simple as importing it. And I'll use my editor's auto completion. And at that point, you can instantly use it. So one more, maybe in settings, if I wanted to migrate this over, I would say script setup and get rid of that. And then in home, and by the way, I'm not even sure if we're gonna keep this. Uh, it entirely works, but it's relatively new and it might feel a little foreign to how you typically create your single file components. But nonetheless, it is an option and it makes things a lot cleaner. So there's your home page, there's settings, and here's users. So you could take this approach, or you could take the approach where you manually register a global component, or you could combine the two. The choice is yours. Extracting a shared component can be incredibly useful, but in its current state, we do have one problem. Have a look. In my browser, if I open up View DevTools, you'll see that the layout is actually a child of our page component, not the other way around. So what this effectively means is every time I browse from page to page, the layout is being destroyed and rebuilt. Now, if that's confusing, let me give you a little example here. In my layout component, let's do something that changes the state. So we'll make this as simple as my app, but I will store it in an input. Okay, so if we give it a refresh, yes, of course, I can change this to anything I want. But notice, as soon as I browse to a different page, it resets. And again, that's because the layout is a child of the page. So when you browse to a new page, that layout gets destroyed. And my guess is you don't want this. So let's reset this, and I'll show you a more practical example. If I bring up another tab here, this is the Laracast podcast that I host at simplecast.com. Why don't we grab an embed link here like so. And I'm going to paste this into our project. So why don't we put it, I don't know, maybe right up here, give that a reformat and get rid of the height, but maybe I will push it down a little bit, something like that, just as an example. Come back to Firefox, give it a refresh. 
and we can now see my podcast at the top of the page. And if I start it up, you'll hear a little audio in the background. But notice, if I click on a new link, it resets for the exact same reason. The podcast is rendered in our layout file, but as soon as I visit a new page, the layout gets destroyed, which means the player is reset. Okay, so what if I want the podcast to continue playing as I browse through my site? And in fact, you might even notice this at Laracast. If you're watching a video and then you click away, the video will keep playing in the bottom right corner. And I do that through persistent layouts. And luckily, it's really easy to implement. The solution is to effectively reverse it. So rather than the layout being a child of the user's page, I instead want the user's page to be a child of the layout. And that way, the layout won't be destroyed each time. We do that by visiting any of our pages, and I'm gonna to switch to this layout property that Inertia provides. I'm declaring what the layout is for this component. Now, when I do that, I no longer have to manually wrap it like so. It will automatically be applied. So if we do that for all of these pages, it's a simple process of getting rid of layout and then switching this like so. One more. Get rid of the wrapping layout and instead register it like so. All right, so believe it or not, that's really all you have to do. Give it a refresh. Notice in View Dev Tools that the layout is now a parent of the user's page. And if I go to Settings, once again, Layout is the parent of Settings. And one more, Layout is the parent of Home, which means this shouldn't be destroyed every time I visit a new page. Start the podcast, go to Users, and it keeps playing, and I'll turn that down. And you can see it's not being reset because it's locked at five seconds. It works. And what's nice is things like this are basically impossible with a traditional server-side app. But if we're using Vue and Inertia and Inertia's persistent layouts, it really couldn't be simpler. So now that we have persistent layouts working, if you want, we can even remove the need to import the layout into every page component. Let's play around with that. If I were to delete this entirely and switch back to the browser, give it a refresh, of course we lose our layout. Okay, now I'm gonna go into my app.js file, and when we resolve the current page component, we're gonna tweak this just a little bit. Now, what we have here is a dynamic import, so that's going to return a promise, which means I can't just do something like this, because again, this is currently pending. So dynamic imports can be incredibly useful, especially for larger projects. And we're gonna talk about that in the next episode. But for now, why don't we switch this over to a common JS require? Now, when we pull this in, we'll actually need to grab the default component off of that. Okay, now of course we ultimately want to return that page component, but yeah, we do wanna set the layout. So before we were manually setting it here on each page, but now we're gonna do it automatically for every page. Page.layout equals, and we'll need to pull in the layout component. Import layout. And we can tweak this a little bit, but this should be enough to get it working. So let's switch back to Firefox. I give it a refresh and it's back. All right, so we have a little more work to do here, but real quick, I'm gonna visit all of my page components and remove the import entirely. Down here. Get rid of layout, like so. Okay, that recompiles. So if I switch back and refresh, now everything should work like it did before, but yeah, it's just a little less code to write. Okay, the last thing I wanna do here, if I switch back, there could be situations where certain pages have their own layout components. And the problem is right now, we would be overwriting it. So what you could do is say something like, well, if we don't have a page layout already, then let's assign it. Or another way to write this would be the, I can't remember what it's called. It's like the, the logical or operator or something like that. But it would effectively be set the page layout equal to what it currently is or the layout import. So this and this are functionally identical. And this is what we get. All right, one more time, give it a test. And it all works just like it did before. So yeah, that's a nice little convenience. Welcome back. Now, before we move on to something else, I'd like to quickly touch upon dynamic imports 
and how that might affect your bundle. So let's do this. I'm gonna visit my webpack.mix file. And here we are compiling JavaScript, we're activating a view, we're compiling some post CSS, we're versioning our assets, but I'm also going to add this extract call. And what this does by default is it automatically extracts any common dependencies from your node modules directory into their own file. And that way you could have a single vendor JavaScript file that can be cached for a long time. But then your main app JavaScript that might be a little more volatile, well, that can constantly be refreshed without forcing the end user to pay the penalty of re-downloading all of that vendor JavaScript code. You separate them. And again, we call this simple vendor extraction. Now, take a look at this. If I were to compile everything down, you'll see that I now have an app.js file. That's our application code. But then I also have two more JavaScript files. One is your Webpack manifest file, and then the other is your vendor JavaScript code. And again, have a look how big this is. Now, granted, we haven't compiled for production, which will drastically bring that size down. But nonetheless, you can see how useful it is to extract this vendor code into its own file. Okay, so the first step is when we add that extract method, all of your code is going to break until you update your script imports or references. So let's do that now. I'll visit app.blade and we'll duplicate this to pull in those other two files, manifest and the vendor code. And that should do it. So if I switch back to Firefox and we give this a refresh, there we go. Okay, so standard vendor extraction is useful. But now, have a look at this. If we go into my app.js file, here, like we discussed in the last episode, we're performing a standard common JS require, which means all of that code from the page component is being included with your standard app bundle. And in fact, why don't we play around with that? And yeah, why don't we look for, how about just this tag right here, text3xl. Let's see if we can find that in our app code. JS app text 3xl, and sure enough, we can find that, again, your page component code is stored within your app.js bundle. And you know what? For, for lots of projects, I think that's probably the way to go. But as your application grows, you might find that it's useful to dynamically import these page components as they are requested on the fly. Okay, so here's how we might do that. Let's go back into app.js, and I'm gonna return this to a dynamic import. But yeah, as we discussed, that returns a promise, which means I can't call default off of a promise. I have to wait for that to resolve. So what we could do is make this uh, an asynchronous function, and then I can say, oh, wait for this import to complete, and only after that's done do I wanna grab that default property off of it. So now it's a subtle change, but I want you to notice something. Notice the assets from our previous compile. Now, if I run it again, it's going to look different. So yes, you have your app and vendor code, but notice you have these three new files. And notice each one represents a single page on your site. These can now be dynamically requested only when you visit that particular page. Have a look. I'm gonna come back to Firefox, give it a refresh, it still works. But then if I pull up the network tab, I only wanna take a look at JavaScript requests. Okay, so let's go to, how about users? And have a look there. Only when I requested that page, did we make a request to fetch the necessary data. Now again, for really small projects like this, honestly, the, the benefit is negligible. But as your application grows, you can imagine situations where certain page components have a bunch of their own dependencies that are needed to make things work. And those could be fairly heavy dependencies. Well, in those cases, it's a shame to make the user download all of that code, especially if they may never even visit the page that uses it. So now, pretty easily with this small change, we're able to pull in all of those dependencies only when you request the corresponding page. So once again, if I go to my home page, then we will request the home JavaScript file. So yeah, this is absolutely something to be aware of. And you'll need to decide for your own projects, is that something that would be beneficial? Or would it be easier to turn off vendor extraction and create a single JavaScript file 
that you can cash for a really long time. And there is no right or wrong answer here. It really just depends on what you're building and how big it is. Next up, let's figure out how to make the head section of your site dynamic. And of course, by head, I'm referring to the head of your HTML document where you set the title and the meta tags. Okay, let's have a look. But first, real quick, we don't need this old podcast in bed anymore. That was only for an example, so I will get rid of it here. Good. And you know what? Also, while we're here, give me 15 seconds to clean that navigation up real quick. Let's see, we have a nav link. Why don't we change the text from blue to plain black? And then I don't think we need list items here, so let's get rid of that. Increase the spacing and get rid of that. Okay, let's see how that looks. And yeah, a little more traditional. I think that looks fine. Okay, let's get going. So yeah, if you think about it, right now, our head is being defined in my main blade layout file. And notice that's separate from the root of our view in Inertia app, which means if I set the title here, yeah, how exactly do I make that dynamic when Inertia doesn't know anything about it? Okay, let me show you how to solve this. Inertia ships with a head view component that we can reach for. So right here, I'm gonna use standard script setup and we will import Inertia's head component. Okay, so now at the top, I can use it here and I can define a title. My app dash home. All right, so let's try it out. We come back, we refresh, and sure enough, I am setting the title here. Now, a quick little tip, if all you ever need to set is the title, you can instead add it as a prop. App home. And that would be an option as well as a self-closing tag. So we come back, refresh, and that works as well. Okay, but anyways, I'm gonna bring that back to what we had before. Okay, so yeah, if you want for every page, you could import your head tag and then add it at the top. Or of course, don't forget, if you wanna register that globally, you now know how to do that. And that might be something you wanna consider. Anyways, there's settings, and then finally one more for the users page. And this is not script setup. Why don't we switch that over real quick? And I will define props like that. Okay, now at the top, I can paste this in. And this is our users page. Okay, so cross our fingers, and I think it should work. Again, pay attention right up here. So we have home, users, and settings. It works. Now here's another cool thing. We could have a fallback of sorts. So for example, what if we forget to set the title on a particular page? Well, right now, if I click the users, yeah, we just don't have a title on that page. Now, if you want, we could set a default in our layout file. Let's see what that might look like. Let's go to layout. I will import it here. And again, this one is not using script setup, so I will have to manually register it as a component. But yes, same thing, right up here at the top. I'll paste it in, and this will be generic. We'll just say my app, or again, we could use this syntax here and reformat. Okay, so now, yeah, again, we have a fallback of sorts. If we don't set a title, then we will stick with what is declared in the layout file. But if we do set a title, and I'll just undo to bring that back, well now, if I give it a refresh, you'll see that takes precedence. Because again, you can only have one title on the page. But this is where you might fall into a little trap. So what if you wanna do the same thing, and I'm gonna bring this back, where the title is declared in line. What if you wanna do the same thing, but you also need a description? So we'll say type is description, and the content, is, you know, information about my app, whatever. Yeah, that's gonna work. So if I come back and refresh, in DevTools, if we have a look around, sure enough, we have our meta tag. But notice, if I wanna override that from a particular page, maybe the home page, home information, notice you're gonna end up with a duplicate when I refresh. Okay, let's go to home, give it a refresh, yeah, notice we have two meta tags for the description, and that's not what we want. 
So yeah, if you want to allow for a sort of inheritance here, we need to give inertia a little more information. We do that by adding this head key. We'll call it description because that's what it is. Then I'm gonna do the same thing on the layout file. And inertia will detect this and ensure that we only ever have one. Okay, so now if I come back and give this a refresh, notice that we only have the single meta tag. And notice how it does that. It adds this little unique inertia attribute. But yeah, for any other page where you're not setting the description, it'll fall back to the default. Okay, so that helps. But now one last thing. Notice that for any page, we begin with the app name, whatever that happens to be. Same thing here. And again, this is such a small site, it just doesn't matter. If you need to tweak it, then you update a few files and you're done. But again, as an example, uh, for a larger, more real life project, if you later want it to be the page name and then maybe the app after it, again, you would have to visit every single page where you define a title. And that could potentially be 50 pages. Um, so there's another way you could do this by defining a template of sorts. Let's bring it back to what I had before. If we visit app.js where we create our inertia app, let's add another one here at the bottom, the title. So this is a function and whatever we return will be set as the title for the app. So if I hard code that to foo, and if I come back and give this a refresh, sure enough, the title is set to foo. But this will accept a argument here, which is whatever your current title is. So notice here, that would be this right here. Okay, so if we accepted that title and simply returned it, well, we haven't really done anything here, but just to show you how that's working, sure enough, we do get my app users. Okay, well now maybe you see where I'm going. We could bring this back to simply the title of the page, and I'll do the same thing here, and users. And just to show you, okay, now it's only showing the page, but now in my template, so to speak, I could add it here. I could say my app and then tack on the title. Come back, refresh, and now I'm defining my app's name only in one location or, or whatever the prefix happens to be. You see how that works. And that means later, yeah, if I do decide, no, we want it to be the title and then my app. You can see how easy it is to update that. And now it works. Okay, and of course, if you want, you can switch this over to a template string like that. Now, I generally prefer my app dash, so we'll stick to that, and I think that looks good. Okay, so now you know how to make your head tags dynamic. The main steps are to import your head component, define it at the top, and if you happen to be overriding a default that you might be declaring in your layout, just make sure that you assign a unique head key. So the only remaining thing I might personally do if I were building an app here is, again, I'm probably gonna have a head on every single page. So it's a little bit of a shame, I think, to have to import it over and over every single time. But you may disagree. So I'm gonna pull this in right up here, and I'm gonna register it as a component here like that. And now I have it globally registered, which means I can once again get rid of that and get rid of that and then get rid of that. And I think that should do the trick. So again, last time I'll bring that back, reformat, and maybe I can do the same thing here. Yeah. All right, final sanity check, give it a refresh. That looks good, the homepage looks good, and the settings looks good. All right, onward to the next episode. Now, if you've never built a single page application before, there's one very big security concern that you need to be aware of. So let's have a look at that in this episode. I will switch to the users tab, and why don't we turn this into a list of users that we fetch from the database and then send to the client. All right, so let's go into users. And yeah, I think we can get rid of this old section here where we show the current time. And instead, we're going to accept a list of users. Users is an array. 
Okay, so as you can imagine, we'll have some kind of unordered list. And then I'm gonna simply iterate over our users. So for user and users, Next, it's a good practice in Vue to always set a key on your loops. So that'll be the user's ID. And then finally, I will set the body of this list item to the user's name in reformat. Okay, so now at this point, of course, we're still not gonna see anything because we're not yet passing users from our controller. That's the next step. But to set this up, I do need a database. So why don't we quickly whip up maybe an SQLite database, something like that. And then within my database directory, I will add our database, database.sqlite, which is the default. Okay, finally, and this is all basic Laravel, if I run my migrations, included in those will be a users table that has a name, an email address, a password, a few other things. So let's do that now. Switch to the terminal, run PHP artisan migrate. There we go. And if I quickly open this, here we go. And sure enough, I do have a users table, but it's currently empty. Okay, let's quickly seed it. So if I switch over to my seeders folder, you'll see this is what Laravel includes out of the box. And it has a little snippet here to quickly whip up 10 users. Why don't we change that number to 100? Now I can run PHP Artisan DB seed. And if we did everything correctly, we should now have 100 users in our database table. And we do. Okay, so that setup is out of the way. The next step, let's go to our routes file again. And let's see, right here is where we access the users. So no longer will I be passing through the current time. Instead, I will send through a list of users. So let's say user, and at least for now, we're gonna say user all, but there's a bit of a red flag here. And you'll see why shortly, okay. But yeah, if I come back and refresh, I think I'm gonna see 100 users, and I do. Great, it's working. But, yeah, that red flag. Let's come and look at Vue DevTools, and let's see what exactly is being passed from the controller. Here's our users. It's an array of 100 items. But yeah, notice that every item is an object that includes a lot of data. Now again, in this case, it's a brand new project, so this is fairly minimal. But you can imagine for any real life project, your users table probably includes a dozen different columns, maybe related to their subscription status or maybe unique billing tokens that you don't want to expose to them. But the problem is right now, all of that information is being passed to the client, which if you think about it presents two problems. The first problem is you're passing through more data than the page actually requires. And that means more data is going over the wire. But the second issue, and the really big issue, I think, is that, again, the entire structure of your users table is being passed to the client, including any fields that you don't want the user to see. Now, I imagine this is pretty clear, but just to make it crystal clear, yeah, maybe your users table includes some kind of token, maybe for Stripe or something like that. I'll just say Stripe token. And that can be nullable. Okay. Then real quick in my user factory, think of this as the blueprint for a dummy user record. And we'll say right here, actually I can just duplicate this, create a dummy Stripe token. Okay, so now I'm going to refresh my database from scratch and I'm also going to seed it in the process. Okay, so again, if we reopen that file, we should have a new Stripe token column. So now think about it, any and every time you add a new column to your users table, well, because we used that user all method, all of the data is being passed to the client and we can access it again right here. Props, users, and notice there's the Stripe token being exposed to the user. And it's not just their token, it's the Stripe token for every single user, including the email address for every single user. So if I wanted to, I could access this page and plug the email address for every user in your system. So yeah, clearly not a great idea. Okay, instead, it's better to be explicit. So if I go back to my routes file, instead of blindly passing user all to the client, let's first map over it so that we can return a subset. So for example, 
maybe we want, well, actually at the moment, the only thing we're making use of is the user's name. So why don't we keep it as basic as we can possibly get? And then later, if we need more fields, we can pass it through at that point. Okay, so have a look, give it a refresh. And now if we take a look, and this time we'll go to the actual users page component. Yes, we still have our users array, but notice that each user object contains only the data that we actually need and none of the data that we don't want them to see. So this is a really important pattern that you need to follow in your own projects. When you're building a traditional server-side application, there's not a big deal with passing something like user all to a view. And that's because that data isn't being exposed to the end user. But when you're building a client-side application, yeah, the rules are a little bit different. It will be exposed through an Ajax call. And again, you can always review those if you wanna see the actual call taking place. Switch to your network tab, turn on XHR, visit a page, and sure enough, we make a request to the user's endpoint, and that returns the JSON for all of our users. But luckily, because we were thoughtful, we're not exposing anything that we don't want the user to see. So now that we've used Eloquent to fetch information from the database and send it to the client, the next step would be to implement pagination. But before we do that, let's take one minute to clean this up. Now, because I'm using Tailwind CSS, why don't we save ourselves a little bit of design time and instead pull in one of these free components from the tailwindui.com website. Maybe something like this. So I can see the code here, I can copy it, and I'll switch to PHP Storm. We'll go to that users page, and yeah, we're gonna swap out the UL with this table layout. So I'm gonna paste in the whole thing. There's a lot to see here, but it's really not that complicated. And if I switch back and give this a refresh, now we can tweak this to our needs. For example, I don't even think I need a table head. So let's get rid of that. All right, and then next, I don't need any of these. So let's see, here's our table rows. Here's the first one, here's the second one. Let's get rid of that, okay. And then two more, that one and that one. And now we have a name, an avatar, and the edit link. But I don't yet have any avatars, so I can get rid of that. All right. And then it looks like I still have some leftover margin here because of the avatar that we deleted. And then I'm not gonna show an email address. So that gives us this. All right, so this is what we end up with, a standard table element with some classes to make it look nice and pretty. So I think we're all set. Let's now migrate this section. So I'll get rid of it. And now for our table rows, this is where we will perform our v4. v4 user and users. We need to give it a key. And actually on that note, I'm not sure we passed through the ID. Let's check that real quick. Let's go to my routes file. And yeah, notice I accidentally forgot to include the ID. So let's add that as well. Or if the ID is something sensitive that you don't want the user to see, you could always reach for a unique ID. Anyways, let's go on back. And now I can swap this out with the user's name. Finally, we don't have any kind of user edit link, but if we did, it would take the shape of something like this, where the href would be uh, potentially users slash the user's ID slash edit. And we can even make that look prettier if we switch to a template string like that. All right, let's have a look, give it a refresh, and now we have a nicely formatted table of all of our users. And notice that each user includes a link to where we can edit that specific person. Okay, design portion done. Next, let's implement pagination. Now, if you're familiar with Laravel, you already know that there is a paginate method we can reach for, but this isn't quite right. So if I come back and refresh, yes, I still see the same thing, but if we have a look at view dev tools, let's go down to our page and we have our users, but there's nothing different. It seems like it's partially working because we're not fetching a hundred users anymore. We only have 15. So for example, if I change that to 10 at a time like this, so yeah, it seems like it's partially working, but I'm missing information about the paginator. What current page are we on? What are the links? Things like that. So here's what the issue is. 
we called user all and then we mapped over it. And when you map over a paginator, you're effectively replacing that collection entirely. So for example, if I were to delete that and switch back, I bet we're gonna get some errors. Give it a refresh and yet yeah, now it doesn't work anymore as you see there. But this does mean we're on the right track. So have a look at this. If I were to just return this directly from the routes before we even touch inertia, have a look what happens. No longer are we returning a collection of only users, but instead an object that yes, contains all of the user's data that's now behind a data property, but it also again has information about the paginator. What page are we on? What's the page to the first URL? What are we starting with? What's the last page? And even cooler, there's this links property that contains all of the relevant links to build up your paginator on the fly. And it can even tell you what page you are currently on. All right, so this is pretty cool. I love how easy Laravel makes this. If I bring this back, now I just have to update my users component to accept not an array of users, but an object that represents that paginator. Okay, now if we scroll back up, we're going to iterate over not the users array, but the array that's in users.data. And you saw that just a minute ago. Okay, so I think that should do it. If we come back and give this a refresh, we now get the same thing as before. But take a look at this and view dev tools on our page. Yeah, now this is what's being sent to our component. We have the array of users, but we also have a list of links to build up the paginator. Okay, let's see if we can implement that. So let's see, maybe to start, we'll do it here at the bottom. And I'll say, this is our paginator. Okay, so we'll have this in a div. Maybe we'll give it a little margin top. And you'll see effectively what we're gonna do here. So down here at the bottom, we want a list of links. Okay, so let's see once again, how do we build this up? We wanna go into users.links. It's an array, so we iterate over it. And for each one, it looks like we have a URL and a label. Okay, so maybe for each one, we should display a link. Link v4 link in users.links. Next, the href is gonna be link.url. And then the text or the HTML will be link.label and reformat. And let's see, the HTML can lead to X. Yes, I'm aware of that. It's not a problem here. Okay, so I'm just grabbing that information here. Let's come back and give it a refresh. Scroll down to the bottom and it's not styled, but notice I think it'll work. So let's go to page 10 and notice the URI reflects that and we have fresh information. So Bella at the top, let's go to page five and now we have Odessa at the top. Everything's working. So we have just a couple of things to wrap up. First, if we're on page one, well, what would the previous link be if you're on page one? Let's see what that does. Well, right now we are rendering a link that goes nowhere. Okay, so let's see how that's rendered. On the first page, users, links, well, actually most of them will contain a URL, but yeah, on the first page, there is no previous link. So there is no URL in that case, which means I shouldn't render a link. And the same would probably be true for the very last one or I'm sorry, at least if we are on the last page, there won't be a next link, of course. So if we take a look at that now, notice the URL is null in the cases where there's nowhere to link you. Okay, so how do we wanna do this? I'll show you the long way and then maybe the cleaner way. We could start by wrapping this in a template. So we iterate over all of the links and for each one, we render a link. So we get something like that. But then within here, we could say, well, if we have a URL, only in that case should we render a link tag. Otherwise, we should render a span tag. And then here, we'll set the HTML to link.label. And yeah, I think that will do the trick. Let's give it a shot. Refresh, scroll down to the bottom, and notice if I'm on the last page, the next link is a span, which is what we want. So yeah, at this point, style it however you want to make it clear. This is muted, it's not clickable in the way that these other ones are. But notice the previous link, if we have a previous page, is a anchor tag or an inertia link. But if we're on page one, sorry, we don't have much real estate here. In that case, it would become a span. 
Okay, so that works, and this is entirely fine. But another option is to use a view dynamic component. To do that, I'm gonna bring this back to what we had before, like this. But instead of explicitly using a link component, we're gonna use this dynamic one. And then I can use the is prop to declare what kind of view component it should use. So for example, if I wanted to repeat a link, then I could do that, and the same thing is going to work just like we had before. Okay, so now we can build this up dynamically. I can say, if we have a URL, then it should be a link. Otherwise, it should be a span. And in fact, this should do the trick. So if I come back and give it a refresh, notice we're gonna get the same thing as we had before, but notice we're using general spans where relevant. And now finally, we can add some basic classes here to make it look pretty, like a little bit of padding around each, and then actually, why don't we do one that's dynamic? If it's a span, maybe the text should be gray to, to signal you can't click on this. So I could say, once again, link.url, text, or actually nothing in that case, but otherwise, text gray 400, or maybe 500. All right, let's give it a shot. Come back, refresh, scroll down, and there we go. And that's good enough for our little demo here. Okay, one or two more quick things, and then I will let you go. Uh, if you'd like, we can extract this to a reusable view component. And that way, anytime you need a paginator, it's up and ready to go. Okay, let's go into resources, JS shared. I'm gonna add a new view component here called pagination. And then let's grab to start everything you see here. And I'll paste that in. But we don't want to assume merge and top, so I will pass that in. And then let's see, what does it need here to function? I guess all it really needs is a array of links. So let's do that here and then iterate over the links rather than assuming that we have some kind of user's object because it could be links for, for anything that can be paginated. All right, I think that is good enough for now. So if I switch back, we can pull in our pagination component and we can send through the links like this. And by the way, notice PHPStorm automatically imported that for us. All right, cross our fingers, come back, refresh, and it failed. <laughs> okay, let's see what I did wrong. User is undefined. User, oh, I'm sorry, users.links. All right, one more time, give it a refresh, and yeah, now it's working. I did lose my margin there, though, so this is where I can pass it in on the fly. And we should have exactly what we had before, and I think that looks pretty good. So finally, the only remaining step is to return the mapping from our controller. Because right now, once again, our users array contains everything from the database. So we can fix that by returning to our routes file. And right here, yeah, remember how before when we called map, we had something like this, where we return the ID like this and the name. But when we called map, it replaced the paginator completely. So we get a new collection. We can fix this by changing it to through. Through is, is almost the same as map, but it's applied to the, the current slice of items rather than returning a brand new collection. So I think that should do the trick. If we give it a refresh, we have a look at users, cross your fingers, and yet yeah, now it's working just like it did before, but now we have a working paginator. And I think that will do it. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, one last little thing. I keep telling you we're almost done. 10 seconds, and then I promise we're done. If we go back to the paginator, let's make sure that we highlight whether we're on the current page. So we can do that. Maybe I'll rewrite this into the object form. Let's do text gray 500 if we don't have a next or previous link. And then I'm gonna say, let's make it bold if we are the current page. And you'll remember there was an active property available. So now we have a little more indication as to what page you're currently on. And with that, we are finally done and ready for something else. So I think the next step will be to add a layer of filtering right up here. When the user types into a search box, we will dynamically update the results to include only the names that match that query. Okay, let's get started. I'm gonna open up my users component and right up here at the top, we're gonna to add some kind of input here and the placeholder will be search. Okay, 
Let's see what that looks like. Give it a refresh and yeah, but we want to get it right up here. So it sounds like we should wrap the H1 and the input within a div. I'll give it a reformat. And then on the div, I'll say, do a display of flex and set it to justify between, which means this will be pushed to the left and this will be pushed to the right. Okay, now if I come back and refresh, it's a little better, but I do see a bit of margin here. So why don't we migrate that right up here? Okay, next on the input itself, why don't we give it a class of border and maybe a little padding on the left and right. And then finally, I will make the input rounded. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, pretty good. So now, yeah, as I type into this, I want to update the results here, which means some kind of request to the server needs to take place. Okay, so it sounds like step one would be keep an eye on this input for changes. How do we do that? Let's set V model and I'll call it search. And then if we scroll down here, if I'm using script setup, all I have to do is define search and make it a ref, which I will import here. And we'll initialize it to an empty string. And do note that we pulled that in. On the other hand, if you're using the options API, like you might be, then use that data method where you return an object like you normally do. So as an example, if I set foobar here and I come back and refresh, the default value will now be foobar. Okay, so that's working. The next step, like I said, is to keep an eye on that input for changes. So let's pull in, uh, we could do watch or watch effect. Let's do watch. And now we'll say, keep an eye on search for changes. And when that happens, at least to get us going, why don't we console.log changed and then the value. And let's see how that looks. So we come back to Firefox, give it a refresh, open up Chrome. And notice as I type here, sure enough, I get the current value of the input. Great. Now we will need to take care of situations like this where we perform too many updates if the user types quickly, but we'll deal with that in just a little bit. The important thing is we can now respond to when the user types into that search input. So let's perform a request. Now, up until this point, we've been using Inertia's link component, the, the wrapper around an anchor tag to perform these requests, but we can also trigger it programmatically when you need to. And this is a good example of that. So again, if you're using the options API, you know that you can do things like this.inertia. But if you're using script.setup, you don't have access to this. So instead, we have to import it manually, like this. Import inertia from inertia. OK, so now I can say inertia.get. Nice and clean. So let's make a get request to the current page. And that would be slash users. Now, as the second argument, we can include any data that should go along with the request. So because this is a get request, that would be included as part of the query string. So let's include search like this. Okay, so as you know, at the moment on the back end, we're not doing anything to filter the result set. So that's not going to work. But if we did everything correctly, I do want to at least see an Ajax request take place. So I will type Q and sure enough, Inertia immediately makes a request to the server, and now it's including what we typed. But yeah, again, on the back end, we're not doing anything. We don't even know that exists. So we return the usual result set, no change. Now, before we fix that though, notice that there's one weird thing here. If I type, it does make the request, but then it immediately resets the search input. And that makes sense if you think about it. When we run inertia.get, that is equivalent to clicking on one of those link components, which means the whole page is going to re-render. And as part of that, it's gonna clear out any state, like you see here. Because usually, that's what you want to happen when you visit a new page. But in situations like this, it's a little bit different, right? I wanna preserve the state. I don't wanna lose what I type here. Okay, easy fix. All I have to do is as the third argument, set the preserve state option to true. Now we're saying when we perform this request, don't get rid of the existing state on the page. All right, let's give it another shot. I'll give it a refresh. And now notice as I type in here are a couple of things. I don't lose focus of the input and I don't lose the state value itself, which means again, if I open up the network tab and let's start looking for Ernestina. Yeah, notice as I type in there, we are performing a lot of queries. So again, we need to deal with throttling there. 
But again, the important thing is we are making a request to the server with the given filter. Okay, so now let's move over to Laravel. Let's go back to our routes file. And let's see, here's where we load that user's page. So it sounds like at some point here, we need to filter the incoming query based on whether or not we have search in the request. All right, let's get going. Now, this could get a little messy, so a little tip here. You can begin a query by calling this query method, and that just means start a new query. So often you'll see developers do this because it allows you to clean things up and put each method call on their own line, like this. Notice how that reads a little better. Next, we're gonna make this call to win. Win is a cool method. It's basically a object-oriented conditional. We can say, if the given conditional turns out to be true, then append to the query in this fashion, okay? So let's say, look in the request for that search key. Now you can use the request helper function if you want, or we're kind of using facades here, so I could say request input search. So if you found something there only on that condition, should you trigger this closure here? Or in other words, when you find something for the search input, append to the query in this way. So now it's very easy. Think about it. How would you filter down the users table? What query would you write? Well, you would do something like query where, and we're effectively saying, give me only the records where the name matches what the user typed into that input. So I could say where name like, and I could retype request input search, or that will be passed to me as the second argument. So I can do it like this. So yeah, we could do this, but we really wanna say anything can come before it and anything can come after it. So as long as that search string exists somewhere in the name column, it's going to be a match. So we can do it like this, or why don't we use string interpolation like that? Okay, let's see how that works. So I'm gonna come back to Firefox, give it a refresh, and now you see it's working. We have a couple issues because maybe that search input should show what we previously typed. But nonetheless, it seems like it's working. So let's delete this and start from scratch. And now, why don't we look for anything starting with an A? And then a U, and then a B, and we get Aubrey. Everything is working, and it's really nice and quick. Let's look for Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, and it looks like we have two. Isn't it neat how easy that is? But we're not quite done. We still have a couple little issues here. So let's come back and just look for, again, uh, a. Now, if I scroll down to the bottom, it looks like we have nine pages worth of results. But yeah, if I tweak that again, now we only have one page. Okay, so that part is working. But notice if I click on a new page here, hmm, I lost my search query here, and the input was reset. So let's figure out why. Let's go back, give it a refresh. We will search for something. But yet yeah, now, if I have a look at any of these links, notice that they link to page two, but they ignore the current query string. Okay, well luckily, Laravel makes this a really easy fix. If I come back, after the paginate method here, I'm going to include this call to with query string. And this is nice because it reads pretty cleanly. Paginate the results and include the query string as part of that. Okay, so with that one change, when Laravel generates the links down here, it's going to take into account the current query string. So notice if I give it a refresh and have a look at them now, they do include that search query, which means that should fix our current issue. Let's see, we're searching for S. The search input is still not reflecting what's in the query, so we'll fix that shortly. But if we did everything right, when I go to page two, it will be page two of the results with this current search. So that's looking good. All right, just a couple more things and then I'll let you go. What about the situation again when the user maybe lands on a page that already includes a search query? So if I get rid of this, what if they land on this page right here? Okay, well, it's showing search results for anything containing an S, but the input does not reflect that. And that makes sense again. If I go back to my users component, we initialized it to an empty string. So of course that's the case. How do we fix this? Uh, well, you have a couple choices. One, on the client side, you could read the query string and say, well, if there is already something for search, then we'll set the initial value to that. Or you could pass it from the server side. 
So let's do the server side approach. I will visit my routes file. And now we're gonna pass through users, but also the existing filters on the page like this. And that would be request and you'd include any filters that you respond to. In this case, the only one is search. All right, so now when we load the page, the server is going to send to the client a list of approved filters, basically. Okay, now let's accept it from the view component. Right up here, our props are now users as well as filters, which is an object. All right, let's have a look. Come back, give it a refresh. Open up View Dev Tools, and if we now look at the users page, there we go. Here's our two props. We have our users, and we have a list, again, of the approved filters that we want to work with. Okay, so now we only need to set the search's initial value equal to what we sent from the server. So we'll say props.filters.search. All right, let's see if it works. Notice that we're currently searching for S, but it's not reflected in the input. But if I give it a refresh, now it is. Okay, so let's look for Enola. That works. It's in the query string. And now if I give it a refresh, we remember it. Let's see if general pagination works. We have W. We go to the next page. The query string is updated. The input state remains unchanged, which we want, but the results update. Okay, so now we are just about done. The only remaining step is if I, well, actually, real quick, let's open up a brand new window. And now I have no history here. Okay, so notice if I slowly search for Ernestina, this is all working. However, if I go to the back button here, notice it created all of these history records. And each one will take you to the previous search, which might be what you want, or it might be kind of annoying. Notice if I'm on the home page and then I go to users and I search for something and then I decide, ah, I don't care about that. Let's go back to home. Mm, I would have to go through every single keystroke, which you, you've probably seen this before. And again, it might be what you want, but in this case, I think it's kind of annoying. So we fix that with a single change. Right here where we perform our request, let's add the replace option. And that should do it. So one more time, let's start with a brand new tab. And this time, if we go to home, then to users, then we search for something, and I go back, notice it takes me right back to home. And that's what we want in this particular case. Notice again, as I search here, we're not creating new history records. And that's because each time we make a request here, we are replacing the current one. Okay, so I think that's about enough for this episode. In the next lesson, we're gonna deal with the situation where when the user types into this input, we're currently making way too many requests to the server. Stay tuned. Okay, so why don't we move on to forms in Inertia, which I think you're really gonna like. So I'm gonna begin by setting up a new endpoint. So we'll do it, how about right here? When the user visits users slash create, we're gonna load a view. Um, we could name this something like create user. Uh, some people will do the, the most important word first. So they'll do something like user create, user show, uh, or we could namespace it, something like users slash create or dot create. All three of these are super common conventions. Just pick one you like. But yeah, this is traditionally what I would do. So if we're gonna take that approach, I should probably update this one to be in a users directory. And if we're listing users, I'd probably call that index. Okay, let's make our updates here. So in pages, I now have a new directory for users and that will go in there. And then finally, I will rename it to index. So now let's add a new one for creating a user. Okay, so as usual, I'm gonna say hello world just to make sure it's working. I'll come back to Firefox, give it a refresh. And if I manually visit users slash create, there we go. All right, let's get going. Uh, first up, we need our head tag and that'll be create user, keep it simple. And then we'll have our H1 that will be three XL and it says create new user. Okay, come back, give it a refresh, there we go. Let's set up our form right here. So think about it, what do we need to create a user? Well, you need to give us their name, 
their email address, and a password. Now, I have a little snippet that I often use here for inputs, and we'll go over this real quick. So we have a div with a little margin. We have a label for the person's name, and that label is for this input here. Again, very simple stuff, just some simple Tailwind classes to make it look a bit more pretty. All right, back to Firefox, and this is what we get. Okay, why don't we set a maximum width and then push it down from the heading? So we can do that right here, and we'll say maximum width, I don't know, medium. We're gonna center it and then push it down from that heading, maybe by seven or eight. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so what else do we need here? We need the user's name, we need their email address. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing again for the email. But the only thing I will change is set the type to email. All right, come back, give it a refresh. There you go. What else do we need? A password. All right. One more time for the password. But of course, we want to set the type to password. Though if you want, uh, if you want to get a little more fancy, you could even add a toggle to change it to regular text if you actually want to see what you're typing in. Finally, I want a submit button. So I'll do that right down here. And I do have, I think, a form submit uh, snippet there. Again, I I'm not trying to go too quickly here, but it's mostly CSS, and we don't care about that too much for this series. All right, so I think we're looking pretty good here. Now, as you know, when working with Vue, in order to submit this form asynchronously, we need to track what the user is typing into each of these inputs. So with that in mind, let's set up a data property. So again, we could do it here with the Options API, or if you're using the Composition API, we could switch to Script Setup and then define it like so. Let form equals an object. That form will contain the user's name, their email address, and their provided password. But of course, with the Composition API, this isn't quite enough. We need to make it reactive by pulling in, in this case, we have an object, so I'm gonna pull in reactive from view and then we'll wrap that. Okay, so now if we scroll on up, think about it, we can set vModel here to form.name. So I bind the value of this input to that uh, field or property. We're gonna have another one here, vModel to form.email. And then down here, vModel to form.password and I'll reformat. Okay, cross your fingers. We come back to Firefox, give it a refresh. We're gonna take a look at view dev tools. And if I look at our page component, here's our form object. And notice as I type into it, there we go. This is what we want. Okay, so now we're successfully tracking what the user types into the form for each of these fields. So the only remaining step is to listen for when the user submits the form and use inertia to make that request rather than the way we would traditionally do it with a server-side framework. Okay, scroll on down and let's see. Why don't we set up a method called, well, submit. Let submit equals a function. Now, how do we submit a form with inertia? Well, it's really easy. Let's import it, import inertia, and then I can simply say inertia.post. Now, if you're curious, in the next episode, I'll show you how to use inertia's form helper. But for now, we're doing it more of the manual way. Okay, so what are we posting to? Well, if I'm creating a user, that endpoint would be a post request to slash users. And then the data I'm sending through would be this form data. And that should at least get us going. All right, so come back up and on our form, we don't actually need any of this because we're not traditionally submitting the form. So instead I'll say, when you submit this form, prevent the default action, and instead call that submit method that we created right down here. All right, let's give it a shot. So to review this, again, I'm gonna open up my network tab so I can see exactly what happens. Okay, John Doe, John at example.com, gibberish, and if I click submit, well, it does fail with a 405, but we expected that. The important thing though is we did hook into that form submission and make the proper request. We made a post to slash users and we did send through 
the relevant data. Okay, so let's return to the server side. And we're now going to listen for a post request to slash users. Route post to slash users. And now this should be Laravel 101 stuff, like validate the request, then create the user, then redirect somewhere. OK, so how do we validate the request? Well, you might do something like request validate, where you say the name is required, so is the email. And then the password's required, but also for email, why don't we say, make sure that's a valid email. And then for the password, you also might want to say it's a minimum number of characters or something like that. But let's keep it nice and simple. OK, so assuming that the validation passes on the server side, we could then move on to creating the user. And that would take the shape of something like user create. So once again, we could manually fill these out. Or I would have to say something like request input name, and that's totally fine. Uh, another little tip, when you validate your request, the validated attributes alone will be returned from that method call. So you'd get something like that. So if you want, you could even pass that to user create. And remember, we would only get to this point if validation has succeeded. Next, we just need to redirect somewhere. OK, so let's talk about this for just a minute. Traditionally, when you're building an SPA, when you respond to a request like this, you might return a JSON response or something like that. That includes information about the user that was created. But remember, we're building an Inertia app, which is a little different. It's a bit more similar to how you would traditionally construct a server-side application. So in this case, when we're done, we don't return a JSON response. We just return a typical redirect. Where do we want to go now? Well, why don't we redirect, return, redirect to users, something like that. And what's nice is, even though Inertia is still performing a traditional AJAX request, it's going to pick up on this and automatically follow that redirect. OK, so again, let's cross our fingers and give it a shot. Give it a refresh. I'm going to create John Doe. Submit. And if we did everything correctly, he should now be included here. And there he is. Let's have a look at the database. Open database, database.sqlite. And let's see, right here, there's John Doe. So it's working, but we do have that one glaring issue where we aren't yet hashing the password. All right, so obviously, we shouldn't ignore that. Now, you could do it here as part of your create call. But it's such an important thing, I will often do it as part of a mutator. So if I visit my user model, I might do something like set password attribute. That'll accept a value. And then here, I will automatically encrypt it. So I would say this attributes password equals, and then I will pass the value to bcrypt. Alternatively, you can do something like hash uh, make. Cool. OK, so let's give that one more shot. I will delete John Doe's account and try again. OK, so one more time, I'll say John Doe 2. Submit. All right, back to table plus. Give it a refresh. And there we go. We have John Doe's account again. But now notice that we are properly hashing his password. OK, so this is good. It's working. But what about the situations where we try to create a user, but the validation fails? OK, we'll deal with that in the next episode. All right, so in the last episode, we got the happy path for creating a user up and running. But now, of course, we need to handle failed validation. OK, first up, let's add a little link here to create a user. So we'll visit user slash index. And yeah, there's that h1. So why don't we add our link here? And that'll go to user slash create, right? And we'll say new user. OK, why don't we make it blue? And if we have a look, yeah, maybe it's a little too big. And it should go right over here. OK, let's make it smaller. And then I'm going to wrap this whole thing within a div, reformat. And then on this wrapper alone, we'll make this a display of flex, align it to the center. And then we probably need to push this away from the heading a little bit. So maybe margin left of two. All right, how's that look? Yeah, pretty good. 
maybe three, and you know what, it's fine. So now we at least have a link to create a new user. Okay, so think about it. If I now switch over to user slash create, we have some automatic browser validation, and that's because I added this required attribute. So what this means is it physically won't let me submit the form or trigger that submit event if I haven't filled anything out. Have a look. And that's useful, but again, remember, you can never exclusively depend on browser or client-side validation. You still have to do that second layer of validation on the server side. And that's because, of course, the user can always bypass the front end entirely. So for things like this, they are nice to have. They're little helpers. But the point is, you can never depend on them. Okay, so to demonstrate that, temporarily, I'm going to remove that required attribute. From there, there, and right up here. Okay, reformat. Now, if I come back and refresh and I try to submit the form, we don't get any feedback at all. So let's try one more time, but this time with the network tab open. Submit, and we did make the request, but we got a 302 redirect back to this page. Let's see, we made our post request, we didn't send any relevant data through, and then we got a redirect response. But notice now, because Inertia will automatically share the errors, we can see that the validation failed. The name is required, the email is required, the password is required. So it looks like everything is rendering properly. We just have to conditionally display the errors. All right, let's do it. What if we add it to start maybe right down here? I might say V if, and how do we look into those errors? Well, I'll show you two ways. First, we can look into the page component, into the props, into the errors, and then look for an actual property name. So page, props, errors, dot name. So if that's not empty or null, then let's set the text equal to that. Then we'll set a class of maybe red and extra small, maybe italic, whatever you want. And actually maybe we should also push it down from the input just a little bit. Okay, let's give it a shot. So one more time, I refresh, I submit it, and now we have feedback. Cool. So we could extract this into its own little helper component, but for now, I'm just gonna duplicate it and that's okay. So this would be for the email. And then finally, this would be for any validation related to the password. All right, let's see. There we go, that's what we want. So why don't we set it up where the name passes? There we go. Now only these two fail. Let's make that pass as well. And everything is working just the way we want. Okay, so that would be fine. Another way, if you don't wanna reach into the page component, which I don't see any issue there, but you could also declare it as a prop. So again, we're using the composition API, so we would do define props, and I could accept the errors here. So now we sort of have access to them locally. That would allow me to then replace every occurrence of page.props.errors with simply errors, like that. It's up to you. Come back to Firefox, refresh, give it one more shot, and it still works. Okay, so now, yeah, the best of both worlds would be to have some automatic browser validation right there and here. But then, of course, you have server-side validation on the back end. So you have two forms of production. And if that does fail, then we redirect back to that page. View will automatically re-render it. And in those cases, we'll display a little bit of feedback to the user. All right, but we're not yet done with forms. In the next episode, let's have a look at Inertia's form helper, which is even cooler. Now, at the moment, our form is working, which is great, but it's still a little naive. Anyone who's ever deployed a form to production before knows that people will take advantage and do all sorts of stupid things. Uh, so to illustrate this, what if I were to create a dummy user? Uh, but before I submit this, we're gonna simulate somebody who just spams that submit button. So what I'll do here is because it's so fast, even with throttling, 
I'm gonna go to my routes file and artificially add some throttling here. So right here, I'm going to sleep for three seconds. Okay, so yeah, what will happen if I visit the network tab? Submit, 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 submit. You can see they've made about seven requests in that span. But inevitably, of course, you're gonna get some kind of query constraint because you're trying to create too many users on the back end. Okay, so the common convention for dealing with this is to automatically disable the button. Just assume that the user is guilty and they're gonna do something weird. So disable the button immediately. Okay, so if we were to do that manually, which is what we often do, we might go to our user create form and right down here, we're now gonna track if, and I'll pull in ref here, we're gonna track if the form is currently processing. Has it been submitted? Okay. We'll say let processing equals ref, and by default, no, you haven't submitted the form. It's not processing. And now, why don't we just say to start, right when we submit the form and we call this method, let's update processing to true. So processing.value, because again, we have that ref there. So to get the underlying uh, Boolean, we have to call dot value, which is kind of annoying to be honest, but that would do it. All right, next, if I scroll up to our button, let's say disable the button if the form is currently processing. Okay, last little thing, let's just comment this out temporarily so that we don't redirect too quickly because I mostly just wanna see that button deactivate. Okay, we come back to Firefox try to create a dummy user. And when I click submit, eh, it looks like the button doesn't have any disabled styling. But if we select it, sure enough, it is disabled. And if we come to our component itself, processing should be set to true, and it is. Okay, so this prevents the situation where we are submitting the form too many times. Notice, as many times as I click on it, we're not performing uh, that Ajax request again. Okay, but of course we wanna turn this on and off conditionally. So one way we could do this is to bring this back. And as part of the third argument, we can provide options for inertia. And some of those options are event hooks. For example, when you start the request or when you finish the request. All right, let's use those. So when you start, why don't we say processing.value is true. And when you finish, let's make it false. Okay, so let's test it out. First, let's do something that will fail the validation. So maybe on the password, I'll disable that required attribute just so I can bypass the browser validation. Okay, next, let's fill this out, but we won't provide a password. Okay, now real quick, we're gonna inspect this button. And don't forget on the server side, we have a sleep for about three seconds. So I click on it, and you see it's disabled, one, two, three. We redirect back to this page, but now the button is once again clickable. It works. So we try it again, but notice I can't click it anymore because it's currently disabled. Okay, so you've probably done this a million times if you've ever built a client-side form. But what's nice is if you want, Inertia can automate some of this stuff for you. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is pull in, use form, from the inertia adapter, and I'm using view three here. Then I can replace this call to reactive with use form. So this is how we would do it with the composition API. If you're using view two or something, you might instead do this.inertia.form, and then you would provide your fields here. So it's just a slight tweak to how you do it with the composition API versus the options API. Okay, so that will automatically be reactive. But now we sort of have this form on steroids, which means inertia will automatically collate and track information about the form, including whether or not it's currently processing, which means I no longer have to do that myself. And that means I can get rid of that import. And even better, I no longer have to manually track this processing property. Instead, well, to start, I could just remove it entirely, but because we're already using form, I can instead rewrite this like so. And now I can remove that inertia import. Kind of cool, isn't it? So the only thing we need to update now is we don't have processing 
at the top level, we now access it through the form helper. So form.processing. Or if we want to grab the errors, we can get rid of that. We can just do form.errors. So let's grab all occurrences of errors, and I'm going to replace that with form.errors, like so. OK, let's give it a shot. So I come back to Firefox. We give it a refresh. And first, I want you to have a look at View Dev Tools. So if we look here, yeah, notice in our form object, and notice here we have the, the RESTful endpoints you'd expect, like making a delete request, or a post request, or a patch request. We have information about any errors. We can check if the form is currently dirty, if it's currently processing, what the progress is, if it was recently submitted. We can even reset the form. So for example, why don't we play around with that real quick? Let's just say, set timeout, and I'm going to reset the form just as an illustration. Form.reset after three seconds. As you'd expect, that's going to clear out the form. So refresh, let's quickly fill it out. And that should be about three seconds, and it resets. So you get all of this stuff for free when you pull in Inertia's form helper. OK, so the only remaining step is just to make sure this works. So I'm going to turn off that sleep, come back, give it a refresh, and we'll set up Jane Doe's account. This is the happy path. It works. We can find her here. Or, but if we now do Susan, but she doesn't provide a password, submit, then of course we still pick up on those validation errors. We fix them, submit, it works, and now everything is up and running. Now that you're a bit more comfortable with forms, let's move on and discuss debouncing and throttling. So you'll remember a few episodes ago, we set up real-time search, which is great. But yeah, have a look at this. If I go to my network tab and we run this search again, notice we're making 10 requests for a single word. Way too much. It's just not necessary. So here's how we might fix that. I'm in my users component, and if I scroll down, yeah, right now we are watching that search input, and when it changes, we immediately make a request. So it sounds like we should say, well, make a request, but don't do it too many times. And we can use Lodash for this. Now, I believe out of the box in Laravel, yeah, Lodash is included as a dependency, but otherwise you can install it like this. OK, so to use it, let's start with, how about throttle? Import throttle from Lodash. And if we want to grab one specific function, we can access it as a file like this. OK, so now we're going to tweak this just a little bit. Now we're going to say throttle like so. And to start, why don't we set it pretty high, something like 500 milliseconds. OK, so with this change, we're basically saying, at most, I want you to trigger this function once every 500 milliseconds. Or in other words, throttle it to once every 500 milliseconds. And to make this even more clear, let's console.log triggered, and we'll have a look in DevTools. OK, so let's see. Go to the console, give it a refresh. And now notice as I'm typing here, I'm not getting 50 or 60 different requests like we would have earlier. Instead, I got one request every 500 milliseconds. Let's do it one more time. I'm going to look for Ernestina like we did before. All right, let's start from scratch. Ernestina. And now it looks like we did three requests instead of what did we have before, 10 or 20? That's throttling. OK, so that's a, that's a good improvement. Now, if we try out debounce, I'm just going to swap this out entirely. Debounce is similar, but just a little bit different. Debounce says, no matter how many times you call this function, I'm only going to do it once after at least 500 milliseconds has passed. So take a look at this. Give it a refresh. And now, as I'm typing here, notice we're not logging anything to the console because I'm still typing. But as soon as I stop, after 500 milliseconds, then it gets triggered. OK, so sometimes you want throttle, and sometimes you want debounce. So again, just to make this crystal clear, now when I look for Ernestina, when we didn't have any throttling or debouncing, we made dozens of requests, right? But now when I look for Ernestina, I typed the whole word, 
And then after 500 milliseconds, which was defined here, only after that did we make the request. Okay, so in situations like this, you have to decide which one do you want. Do you want to wait for the user to finish typing before you make the request? Or do you want the results to update while you're in the middle of typing? That might be useful. And really, there's no right or wrong answer here. I will often just by habit reach for debounce and do something like 300 milliseconds. But yeah, throttling is a good way to go as well. So let's see what this looks like. Refresh. I'm going to look for Anastina again. And yeah, when I'm done typing, I get the results after a third of a second. Now compare that to throttling. And we'll come back and refresh. Notice now as I type it, you're going to see some updates while I'm still finishing that name. So it's up to you. Now, the general rule might be if you're very sensitive to your server getting hit too hard, maybe you should reach for debounce. On the other hand, if you can handle it and you want to provide a reasonable amount of instant feedback to the user, then you would reach for throttle instead. In our case, why don't we stick with debounce? And this is what we get. All right, so this is an extremely common pattern that you'll use all over the place. Whenever you're making requests as the result of what a user is currently typing in, you'll just about always reach for one of these functions. I think we can now move on to authentication. And you know what? I think you're going to like it because it's going to feel just like traditional authentication in Laravel. Or in other words, you're not going to deal with tokens or OAuth or any of that stuff. So I think you'll feel right at home. So let's do this. At the moment, for all of these pages, we've just sort of assumed that we had an authenticated user. But now let's make that an actual thing. So if we have a look here, let's get rid of the comments. We have all of this here, users, create a user, post a user, settings, logout. Really, all of that should assume a logged in user. So let's say route middleware, we want the auth middleware, and we're gonna group that for all of these routes within it. So I'll paste that there and reformat. Okay, so now every single route here will inherit the auth middleware, which means if I come back and I refresh the settings page, uh, we get an issue, but it is actually working. So it's trying to redirect me to a login route, but we haven't yet created that. Okay, let's do that now. We can do it right at the top. We'll say, listen to a get request to login, and that's gonna load some new controller called login controller, and a create action there. But it's not quite enough. You'll see right here, it's trying to find a route with a name of login. So not a URI, but a name. So let's make sure we give this a name of login. So basically what's happening here is in Laravel's auth middleware, on the condition that you are not authenticated, it tries to link you to this route with the name of login. And up until this point, that route didn't exist, which is why we saw that error or exception. Okay, so let's switch back and go ahead and create this controller. PHP artisan make controller, login controller. All right, but you know what, come to think of it, why don't we instead place this within an auth directory? So we'll add that here and move it over. And then of course, I just need to update the namespace like so, and then re-import that. Okay, so we said we need a method called create and we'll say, please log in just to make sure it's working. Okay, only remaining step is to go back to our routes file and officially import it at the top. All right, cross your fingers, come back, give it a refresh, and sure enough, it redirects us to the login page because we're not authenticated. All right, let's get started. Now, you will see that I'm using a controller here, but up until this point, we've been using route closures, which is perfectly fine, especially for small projects. But yeah, for most of the things I build, uh, I usually will reach for controllers across the board. So maybe at some point near the end of the series, I will quickly migrate all of these. But yeah, from now on, I wanna start moving toward the way I would personally construct these things. Okay, so let's go into our login controller. So let's return and we'll ask Inertia to render a view called auth login and give that a reformat. All right, let's create that now. So in my resources directory, I'm gonna create a new view component in the auth directory called login. 
Okay, once again, just to make sure it's working. Okay, so come back, we give this a refresh, and there we go. But now notice one thing. We see the navigation bar here that really assumes you're already signed in. So for example, welcome back John Doe, and then users and settings. Uh, we could of course conditionally display those things. But really, if we're logging in, we probably don't need to see any of this at all. So it sounds like we don't wanna use the layout file in this case. And you'll remember many episodes ago, we automatically set the layout file. Just to refresh your memory, here's where we require the page component. And then here we say, well, if you didn't already set a layout, let's do that for you. But yeah, it sounds like I wanna turn that off. So we may have to tweak this just a little bit. Let's go back to our login view. And here, I'm gonna set layout to null. Okay, so now if I come back to Firefox, ooh, we have an issue here. Even though I tried to effectively disable it, it's still being applied. And again, that's because of the way I set this up here. What we have here basically means if layout is null, then just set it to this layout component. So in our case, layout was null, so it set it to the default component. Okay, why don't we tweak this just a little bit? This is no longer quite right. Let's say if page.layout is undefined, only on that condition do we automatically set it. But if it's something else or if it's null, then we should leave it alone. Okay, now if we come back and give it a refresh, I think that's gonna work. Yeah, now we've disabled it entirely. But yeah, if we were to remove this, it should still be applied. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, so let's quickly do a little bit of styling here. Now to save us time, we already created a form in the user create page. So I'm gonna grab a lot of this here, switch back, and then we'll just tweak it a little bit. But first, because I disabled the layout, we'll have a main section, maybe an inner section here, and that section would be like our white card. So maybe I could say background is white, maybe padding all around, make it rounded, something like that. And we'll do swap these out here and then update this to login, you know, something like that. So let's see what we'll need here. When you're logging in, you don't need to give us a name, but we do need your email and your password. And then we'll update this to log in. And then finally down here, and if we're using the options API, we would do props like this, or just again, to keep it a little consistent, we've been using the composition API. So I'm gonna do script setup here, and then let's create our form. And you'll remember, we need to use Inertia's form helper, and that gets imported automatically. Okay, so what do we have here? An email and a password. That's what you have to give us. Now, a little note here, you'll see that I have created two script tags, at the time of this recording, I don't know of any way to disable the layout from within script setup. That might change when you're watching this, but yeah, again, at the moment, the only way to allow for this is to create two script tags, which is uh, admittedly a little annoying. Just do it or stick with the options API. Okay, so if I switch back to Firefox, here's what we get. Close, but no cigar. Let's go back up, and maybe I will put that login heading within the section. And then on the form, give me just a moment, maybe I can put this up here. Let's see what that looks like. Switch back, yeah, getting a little closer, but I would like this perfectly centered on the page. So on the main section, I can use standard Flexbox for that. Flex, or actually, you know what? Why don't we do a grid and we can say place items to the center and that should achieve the same thing. But for that to work, we do have to make sure that this main tag takes up the full height. So let's say minimum height is screen, which basically means at minimum, it needs to be 100% of that window's height. All right, so if I switch back and give it a refresh, yeah, now it's centered. Okay, just a couple of things and I think we're ready to go. Let's give it some margin bottom on the heading. And then maybe we could add a border around the section. Yeah and maybe even increase the rounded to rounded XL. And I think that's good. We might wanna make these borders more consistent. So real quick, 
let's get rid of all of the border gray and just stick with the default color. And then on these inputs, and by the way, these could also be their own view components so that you don't end up with this duplication. And then maybe we could, we probably don't want to make them full Excel, but maybe a little rounded uh, input might be good. Okay, and if we switch back, that's good enough for me. So think about it. How should we submit this form? Well, we already have the event handler set up from the previous page. So I'll scroll down and we'll declare this method. And what should happen when you submit? Well, we're already using Inertia's form helper. So can I just say form.post to login? All right, let's see what happens there. Come back, give it a refresh. I'll try to sign in John. I don't think he exists. Login. And yeah, now we do get a method not allowed exception. We're trying to post to slash login, but we haven't yet created that. Okay, that's our next step. So right up here, let's listen for post to login, and that will hit a store action. All right, let's do that now. Store, and this is where we log in the user. All right, so let's do this to save a little bit of time. I'm gonna go to the Laravel docs, and if I search for authentication in the security section, of course, you may know that Laravel offers a bunch of starter kits or quick starts. And by the way, many of those will have inertia options or flavors or adapters that you can use. But in our case, we're just doing it manually to illustrate the basic process. Anyways, when we manually authenticate a user, here's a full example of basically what needs to happen. You validate the request, you try to sign in the user, if that was successful, you regenerate their session, and then you redirect them where they intended to go. Otherwise, you redirect back with validation errors. So let's save ourselves some time and just grab all of that and paste it in here. And then I will just update store and import the request. And also the auth facade. All right, saves a little bit of time. Now, this should be fairly easy to understand. The only thing that might be confusing is redirect intended. So imagine a situation where you try to visit your, say, settings page, but you're not signed in. Well, in that case, you are trying to go to settings, but it's going to redirect you to the login page. Well, what redirect intended does is after you log in, it will remember, oh, you were trying to go to the settings page. So let's just go ahead and send you there. That's how that works. In our case, uh, we probably just want to go to the home page, which would be fine. But as you can see here, the home page is also the default. So let's get rid of it entirely. And I think that'll get us going. So let's go back to Firefox and try to sign in again. Now, I believe a couple episodes ago, I set up a Susan account. But real quick, just to show you that the validation is working, if I log in, we do see a validation error. Okay. There we go. So now we are officially signed in and do note that it redirected us to where we intended to go. Okay, so now we can make a lot of this more dynamic. Before we were hard coding a user, but we don't have to do that anymore. So let's go into our layout and let's see, welcome back username. And let's see, ah, so we were already fetching that dynamically. So it sounds like I just need to go to handle inertia requests and let's see, ah, yeah. We must have hard-coded this a number of episodes ago. Now we can change this to auth user name. But one little thing, this is gonna work. So if I come back and refresh, sure enough, we see welcome back, Susan. But yeah, if Susan is not signed in, then auth user will return null. And then when we try to access name on null, it'll throw an error. So what you might do is something like this. Check to see if we have an authenticated user. And if so, grab only the information you care about. Otherwise, make auth equal to null. And that should do it. Okay, now before I finish up here, a common question people will often ask is something like, well, why are you doing it like this instead of auth user and then the only method to grab only the, the fields that you care about? So the username or their name or their email or things like that. And you can do that, it's totally fine. Just the one thing to be aware of is that now you have a direct one-to-one -one relationship between your table column names and the properties that you pass to the client. And you may not always want those to be the same. 
And actually, often you won't want those to be the same. So that's why if we switch back to this example here, we have a little more control. Actually, in this case, notice I happen to be calling it username, even though it's pointing to an actual name. And that's just a mistake on my part. It doesn't really matter. But again, it's an example of how there might be situations where what you want to use on the client isn't necessarily the name of the column in the database table. So with this approach, we are separating the two. Okay, but anyways, if I come back to Firefox and give it a refresh, this is looking pretty good. So now that we are logged in, we need a way to log out. So let's add a logout link to the nav bar. All right, let's go to layout. And let's see, looks like we created a nav component. Settings, yeah, I'm just gonna add another one here. And this will log out. Now this will go to a logout endpoint and it doesn't make sense for this ever to be active. So let's get rid of that and have a look. Refresh. And yeah, now we have a logout link. But when I click on it, of course, it's going to make a get request to log out. And generally, eh, it's a better practice to instead submit a post request to log a user out. And luckily, Inertia makes this really easy. So real quick, notice that on our nav link component, that's actually just deferring to Inertia's link component. So anything I pass to navlink will be sent to the link component. Okay, so inertia's link component includes a method prop we can use to declare the request verb or method. So in our case, if I wanted to make a post request, it's as simple as that, which is really cool. Usually for anything that's not a get request, you'd have to create a form or do something weird like that. Uh, but this should do the trick. So now we haven't created that logout endpoint yet, but do notice when I click on it, we, oh, actually, you know what? I think a long time ago, we did create a logout. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, just to show you what this would look like. So if I open up the network tab, we should now see that we're making a post request to logout. Okay, so let's get rid of this entirely, and I'm gonna move it all the way up here. If you make a post request to slash logout, that will hit the login controller and maybe a destroy action. But actually, this is the only case where you do need to be signed in in order to access this route. So I could put it within here, but I just want it to be near all of the other login routes. So I will manually add this on like so. Okay, so now we'll set up our destroy action. And this is very simple. We can just say auth logout, and then let's redirect you to the login page. So I could hard code it, or I could say redirect to the route named login. Or in real life, maybe there's a splash page for your app, uh, in which case you'd redirect there. Okay, let's see if it works. Log out, and it works. So you see what I mean, how authentication in an Inertia app is really no different from how you would authenticate in a traditional Laravel server-side app. It's the same basic process, which is one of the big wins when you use Inertia. All of that overhead of tokens and OAuth and figuring out how all of that should communicate, it goes out the window. You don't even need to think about it at all. All right, let's wrap up this series by having a look at authorization. So you remember a few episodes ago, we added this link to create a new user. But now, let's say only certain people in the system are authorized to create users. And the problem is right now, anyone can create a user, which you may not want. All right, let's see what we can do. I'm gonna to return to route slash web. And if we scroll down, here's the user's endpoint. And let's see, we'll add a new prop here called can. Can you create a user? Create user. And right now I'm gonna hard code it. We'll say false. Nobody can create a user right now. Okay, so now if I go to my users slash index component, we will accept can, which is the authorization. And now if I scroll all the way to the top where we add a new user, we can now conditionally display this with if can create user. All right, let's see if it worked. Come back to Firefox, give it a refresh, and I no longer see that link. Cool. So now if we go back to the routes file, let's make it a little more dynamic. Let's check if the authenticated user's email happens to be somebody who's the administrator. So I think I'm signed in as Susan and her email is susan at 
com. Okay, that's a simple bit of authorization. So now if I come back and refresh, only on the condition that you have that email will you see this link. But if it were somebody else, maybe John, well now I, as Susan, will not see that link. Perfect. Okay, but now, don't forget, that only gets us half of the way there. Yes, we're not displaying the link, but we're also not protecting the endpoint, which means if I try to access user slash create, well, we can still create a user, even though that's supposed to be unauthorized. Okay, so now if I switch back, okay, so how do we do this? Right now we're sort of hard coding this logic within the route, but we also want that logic to be applied to the accessing of the route itself. In these situations, I like to reach for a policy like this. PHP Artisan, make me a policy called user policy, and that will be a policy for the user model. Okay, so now in the sidebar, we will find a new app policies directory right here, and there's our first one. Okay, so Laravel gives us a bunch of these actions we can use, but to keep it simple, I'm going to get rid of everything except, how about just create. Okay, so now think about it. I'm just going to grab all of our logic before, paste it in, but this time, rather than checking the authenticated user, we instead receive the current user that Laravel passes for us. So let's check if the user's email address is John Doe. Okay, great. So now we have a policy that we can use in a number of places. First up, we're going to remove this and check if the authenticated user can create a user. And that should do it. So now if I switch back and refresh, we still don't see it because only John Doe is authorized. Let's bring that back to Susan. And now she should see it. Okay, great. So now that we've extracted that authorization logic into its own policy, we can now protect this create endpoint in the same way. All right, so we come back, scroll down to where we create a new user, and I'll show you two ways to add this. Traditionally, you would use the middleware method and you would use the can middleware. So can we create a new user? And because we don't have an existing user record, we provide the class path app models user. Okay, so now Susan can access this link, but if I bring it back to John, she can't and she'll get a 403 unauthorized. Okay, this is what we want. So now, assuming Susan is not an administrator, she doesn't see a link to create a user. And even if she tries to access the endpoint to create a user, it still won't work. But of course, if she is authorized, then she can access it and she will see the link. That's how we can allow for this. Okay, one last thing before I let you go. So that handles sort of top level authorization. But what about other things? For example, right now we're just assuming you can edit any user. But again, maybe it's a little more complex Maybe you can only edit certain users, maybe users who are on your team or who report to you or, or something like that. So in those cases, if you think about it, we have to sort of deal with per record authorization. Okay, well, let's just do the same thing. This was at the top level, but if we also conditionally have authorization for each record, then maybe we can add it here. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Now you don't have to wrap this within a can array or object. If you'd rather just say something like createable or editable, you can do that as well. It really doesn't matter. Just by convention though, I learned it this way, so it's kind of what I stick to, but there's no real right or wrong here. Okay, so can we edit the given user here? And I'm gonna use the exact same logic. Auth user can, and this time I'll call an action edit the given user. Okay, so let's go back to our policy. We had one for create, now we're gonna do another one for edit. Now remember, this is the current user. The second argument would be the user that the current user is editing. So I kinda wanna call that user as well, but I'll just stick with model or other user or whatever you want. Okay, so now in this case, it's a demo app. I don't really have any actual logic. We don't have teams or hierarchy or anything like that. So why don't we just make it random for the demo? So let's return a random number between zero and one. 
and I'll force that to a Boolean. Okay, but yeah, of course in real life, remember, uh, according to your app's logic, you would reach for these users to figure out if one can edit the other. Okay, so now if I come back to our users slash index component, let's find that edit link. And once again, I will conditionally display it if the current user can edit. And you can see why I often use that can array or the object. I think it just reads a bit better in your view component. Show this TD if the user can edit. And again, just to be crystal clear, we are accessing that here. So for each user, we're gonna add can and then edit. All right, so let's come back to Firefox, give this a refresh, and now some of them are turned on and some aren't. And in this case, because it's dynamic, it'll be different every single time, which is a bit weird, uh, but <laughs> not a great idea, but uh, you get the idea for the demo. And let's just do this. Okay, so I think we are about done. Oh yeah, last little thing. You can call the can middleware like this, or in the latest version of Laravel, you can call a can method directly off of your route declaration. So that would change to can, create, and then you provide the model name here. But just a little note, if you're working along and that's not working for you, you just need to update Laravel because it was recently added at the time of this recording. So I can just do a quick composer update like that. Now, if I come back and give this a refresh, it will work. All right, so I think that's about enough to wrap up this introductory series. But rest assured, if you do want to dig deeper, we will be providing a bunch of content at Laracast to help you out. So if you want some homework, right now we added these edit links, but we haven't implemented them. So your job would be to add a new endpoint to edit a user. And if you want some basic ideas on how you would do that, well, think about it. First, you would need to add a new route to edit a user. Next, make sure that you add the necessary authorization. Then you would, of course, create a new inertia component. So users slash edit, where you would add your form. And your form can probably snatch a bunch of this logic here to save yourself a little bit of time. See if you can get that up and running. And if you need any help, of course, ask questions in the comments below. All right. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it.